Good morning. We are calling to order meeting number 279 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission on Thursday, September 20, 20 no, it's not September. October. October. Today October is 9th. October 10th, um, 2019 at 10 a.m. at our offices here in Boston at 101 Federal Street. We'll begin with item number two. Commissioner uh, Stebbins, please. Sure. Good morning, Madam Chair. In your packet, you have the minutes from the September 26, 2019 meeting. I would move their approval again, subject to correction for any typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Any discussion or recommended edits this time? Barring no further discussion, thank you, Shara. Excellent. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0, thank you. Next item is the administrative update. I do not see our executive director this morning. Catherine. Good morning, commissioners. Executive sick. Director Bedrosian is out sick today. Um, he's asked me to give you an update on the 2020 racing applications. We received by the appropriate deadline one application. It is from Plainville Gaming and Redevelopment, also known as Plain Ridge Park. They have filed um, a timely racing for 110 racing days, harness racing at the PPC race course. We have scheduled the hearing in the community, which is a hearing in Plainville at the Plainville Town Hall for October 31st at 10 a.m. Between now and then, we will go through the application, redact it where appropriate, and put it on our website. So if anyone has comments, they can submit them into us before the hearing. And then uh, all the commissioners have received a copy of the application so that you can take a look at it. And if you have any questions, please let us know. Once we have the hearing in the community, we will be back before the commission on November 7th for you to ask any questions of the applicant and then to make your decision on that application. Any questions for Catherine? So you said you said the hearing date was uh, scheduled for October 31st. That's mm -hmm. correct. And any commissioner can come. It's a, a public meeting. Commissioner yep. Cameron will preside, but any anyone's welcome to come. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we were going to be in Plain Ridge at a different date mm -hmm. for a different meeting, right? November 7th. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the hearing needs to proceed. Yes. Yes, so that's right. We'll be voting on the application. On November, uh, November 7th. 7th? On November 7th, oh, yes. Right. Got it. Okay. So 10 a.m. in the in the hearing is where? The, at the new um, at the new town hall, as opposed to usually we've had it at the senior center. So it's nice with that new facility to have it there. Okay. Great. Any further updates? That's today? all I have. Okay. Thank you. Item number four, uh, this is the commissioner's um, reports or updates. Uh, <clears throat> we've decided to bring this to the beginning of the meeting because it warrants uh, considerable attention and we've had it at the end of the agenda last meeting. This is concerning the re, um, relicensing for Plain Ridge. Commissioners uh, O'Brien and Zuniga. I think we've had a general conversation about what we should consider in terms of renewal, but I think the most pressing issue today, I had some conversations with um, IEB about timing and what they need direction from from us, and in particular the depth of review on the licensee and the qualifiers. And, and based on my conversations, and I'm sure Ms. Wells can elaborate, they, they, are doing, they do ongoing reviews, obviously, um, of everyone, and then they have a process when people are changing in and out. They have different forms that they have used for um, the vendors and the licensees, et cetera, and how they refresh um, if there's any change in circumstance. I think based on my conversations, my recommendation would be that be the process that we direct IEB to conduct in connection with the renewal of the license. Um, maybe Ms. Wells can give the rest of you more detail on what that means, but my conversations with IEB, I felt very confident that in, in addition to the ongoing review that they do all the time, making sure that they follow that in connection with this process would satisfy due diligence in terms of the licensee. Yeah, that makes sense. Commissioner, do you wish to add before we hear from Director Wells? Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, the, the bottom line is pretty much what, uh, what Commissioner O'Brien says. I, I'm there as well. Uh, uh, 
um, Karen will uh, explain the process uh, for renewal for vendors of which we intend to recommend, or we recommend that uh, uh, that be followed in this case for investigations and updates of, of PEN. Uh, but just to expound a little bit on, on, on the prior uh, remarks, um, it's, it's, it's really, um, context here matters quite a bit. Um, there is specifically has been um, a, a couple of really um, noteworthy and important procedures that we've uh, done uh, recently, notably with the investigation as a re uh, in, into the, uh, the merger and the transaction into the REIT for Penn, which was uh, done in two phases, um, a temporary uh, approval and a final approval. If, if anybody's interested, we could go through through that. But it's important that to note that that's an important context into um, what has happened recently for for the review of PEN. Other things that you alluded to, Commissioner uh, um, Director Wells can also uh, expound upon. But um, the every new qualifier follows the same procedure or an investigation. Um, it's the multi-jurisdictional uh, uh, BET form with the supplemental Massachusetts form. Um, so uh, the initial investigation that we had, because everybody was a new qualifier at the time with all the historical, really has a, a natural refresh into um, the years as we, as we move along. And uh, last but not least, it's um, uh, all of, well, two more things. Um, all of the qualifiers, the licensees, the executives, the key gaming executives, they are, they're all under the affirmative continuing obligation to report any issues to uh, the IEB, and they in fact do. They collect them, they read them, they uh, analyze them, and, and so the very nature of licensing them and knowing them um, really on a day-to-day -day really would not warrant, in, in our opinion, the initial deep dive, uh, uh, as it's been uh, referred to, that that we did um, uh, back then. So, do you want to uh, yeah. like expound a little bit on what yeah. we do for vendors, which is yeah. what we're trying so, to emulate? Yeah. Again, the uh, you know the IEB is just looking for a general policy directive from the commission, so we know what we're um, expected to do uh, for this renewal, and it's the, the range could be from the deep dive to do nothing and you know because there's ongoing suitability so based on internal conversations you know, the IEB's recommendation is that we do a review uh, which is uh, generally similar to the renewal protocol that we have established for gaming vendors primary so those are the slot machine manufacturers the table game manufacturers these are companies we take a very hard look at because it goes directly to the integrity of the games and want to know um, about those companies in in depth so the renewal protocol for those companies, they, they get licensed for three years. So it, it makes sense that you'd have a streamlined process if you're only renewing, if you're only licensed for three years and you're renewing. You can't do a deep dive every three years because it takes years sometimes to do those investigations. So we have a streamlined process um, that involves abbreviated form submission, uh, a confirmation of ongoing suitability disclosure requirements, and it does have both the state police and a financial investigator uh, uh, investigation and review and analysis. Um, so the recommendation is that we translate that protocol to the pen renewal. Uh, I would also uh, take a look to include the uh, questions that the commission just recently uh, reviewed for the Massachusetts supplement mm -hmm. that we had a public meeting discussion on. Whether we have them fill out the mass sup or I just add the questions to the form, I can do it either way. I'll just uh, see what makes sense based on uh, potential redundancy in the, in the application. But given that there is an ongoing suitability requirement for all our licensees, um, I think it makes the most sense because we do have a sense of the company and we're always checking, do, you know, is there ongoing litigation? Is there have there been other regulatory infractions? What's going on with the with the uh, executives on their individual mm -hmm. basis? So um, you know the reasons I would suggest in summary that we are recommending this type of review for the pen suitability renewal uh, is the category two license term is only five years, unlike the 15 year of the category one licensees. 
and as we've discussed, once um, license suitability is ongoing and the burden is on the applicant to maintain that suitability and uh, provide information to the uh, to the commission, there is a continuing duty to report. And as um, our experience with Penn National is they are very actually they have a very good system of reporting. They're licensed in multiple jurisdictions. They have people that are assigned to make sure that. Uh, license that uh, their regulators are informed of any activity that's going on, any changes, any uh, potential regulatory infractions, things that are going on, and they've done a good job with that. Um, and we do have an ongoing relationship uh, with the company, and we do monitor those issues with the company. So we monitor their SEC filings, uh, litigation reports, compliance matters, et cetera. So it's not as if we're coming in cold the way we were back in 2013, where we're just trying to understand even what this company did and what their background was. Um, the, other, the other point, just to um, make it, is that the uh, the IEB recently also did an analysis of that whole REIT transaction. So that took a big look at the company and, and the, um, you know, the changes that were going on there. And there were certain new, new qualifiers, and we looked at those. So that has been very recent. Um, you know, given that there have been no significant areas of concern with Penn National with, related, with relation to their ongoing suitability, I think that this format where we have an established protocol, we have forms, if we can just modify that for this uh, purpose, that's the most efficient use of our time, resources, and uh, it will uh, sort of effectuate the due diligence requirements for an ongoing suitability uh, of the licensee for your decision. Director Wells, um, I, I think whatever we do should is set sets a precedent, and so I, I mean I'm hearing all of the the ways that Penn has been responsive. Um, but I'm just, uh, do you feel like this, um, this methodology minimizes our risk? For example, if we had a licensee who had multiple issues, um, which they don't, I understand that, but right. is this something, um, this, what you're recommending, this format, um, you would feel comfortable with this, that we would still be minimizing our risk, you'd be looking at all the pertinent issues I understand in, in an abbreviated format. Right, and I, I think th that's, a, that's a very good point because whenever we do an investigation, mm -hmm. you know, the, the forms and sort of that cursory review is a, is a mechanism to identify red flags, identify areas of concern where the investigator can take a, take a look at that area. So for example, if there was a licensee that had an issue, even if we use these abbreviated forms, this will catch the major areas where there may be an issue of concern, and that does not preclude the investigators from going in that direction. So we have broad discretion as to what we want to look at, and if anything comes up, even if it's in an open source check on a, you know, an, on an, uh, either a press article or some other information, uh, we still have the ability and the resources to go down that road and, and look at that in depth. It's the, uh, the recommendation on the, the, the system is just how do we sort of start the investigation and get the initial information and, and go in that direction. You know, can I um, expound on, on, um, on I think what I think uh, you, also, uh, you also mean, uh, which is, uh, you know, this question of precedent. The way we, at least I have been uh, thinking about it, and I think we should, um, is that uh, these would be should be flexible for one, um, but also perhaps only applicable to category two license. Right. Um, in cate category ones are, well, 14 years from now, and admittedly, many of us are not gonna be here. Um, and uh, regardless, it's, 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 it, would be, it would be very hard uh, to bind, let's say, or, you know, or, or um, uh, force a commission, the future commission's hand as to what they might want to do there uh, in that in that sense, um, you know. Unless I'm really, I really, I really think it's impractical for us to start issuing regulations, let's say, on renewals that apply to category ones at this juncture. Um, but right, no, I, I would agree with that, and I, I was going to make the same point. And also to your point in terms of how long it takes to have someone on a five-year term where half the term is basically processing the renewal right. is just also a waste of resources right. on everybody's part. Um, the one thing that I did comment on when I talked to IB, and I want to raise this with everyone, is 
while I don't think we need a formal process and we don't need new forms and we can work with what we have, I would like there to be a memorialization at the end in terms of were there any issues that needed to be vetted further and an overview of what was done so that if somebody is looking back historically, particularly 14 years from now, maybe trying to figure out how to renew category one, there's something discrete that they can go to to see what process we followed. And so I do want something in writing. It doesn't have to be to the level of a full-blown suitability report necessarily, but something that would be public record in terms mm -hmm. of what was done. Yeah, I'm thinking that, uh, you know, obviously a 500, 600 page report is not what I think the commission is looking for, right. but I can do some kind of either letter to the commission or memo to the commission, just sort of outlining in broad strokes what, what uh, you know, what the review encompassed and if there were any issues, and they may be resolved. Sometimes things come up and resolve them and we realize that, okay, it's it's not something that the commission needs to be concerned about. But if there are, uh, you need to know about that. Right. So and, and, and there could be, there's, there's a larger, not just the investigatory material and the forms, uh, but perhaps what you also mean is the, the, the broader scope of review, which I think we're gonna talk about in a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I think there, um, there is an assumption and a presumption that we'll do a compliance review with all of the initial um, uh, promises or, or you know, commitments that, that they made, some of which is done by our ombudsman and, 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 and staff, um, that there might be also a, um, a um, what I suggest should happen, which is a little bit of um, more focus into um, the property uh, financials, which is something we have not done as recently. The retransaction focused a lot mostly on the company and the other company qualifier, in, in that case, GLPI. So there are specific procedures that I think we should, you know, we should undergo and memorialize, of course, because I, I would submit that they might be more relevant five years from now if we extend the license for, for five years. Um, even before the other category ones. Yeah, I would just add, um, I like the idea of keeping the, the review simple. Um, and I think from our conversation yesterday, I like the process you have been envisioned in addition to answering some of the new questions that we added to the mass sub form. Um, but if you, you also look back when we did the RFA1 and RFA2, you came back to us at the start of our RFA2 deliberations to give us an update on suitability. So that's something we've done already and I think it kind of fits nicely into a renewal process to have that part of the report from you. So I just want to uh, <coughs> comment uh, with respect to Commissioner uh, Cameron's uh, observation. It is difficult to think about policy making uh, when we take into consideration either the personalities that are in place at the time of decision making or in this case the, the entity that we're looking at. And you know, kudos to uh, PPC for uh, being so good at reporting to you and your team, um, Director Wells. That's an important part of the ongoing um, suitability process that we must do. And so it's putting us in the position where, to Commissioner um, O'Brien's point, it, it wouldn't necessarily, it would not make sense, I can say more affirmatively, to use these uh, critical resources to really duplicate efforts that have already been done. So I would just reiterate that uh, a decision to not do the quote unquote deep dive at this time is in no way compromising or, ch or in any way um, not uh, indicating the importance of our vigilance. It's that we have been vigilant during the course of the, the period. Mm -hmm. And so going forward, you know, who knows what the future will bring, but if I understand right now, you're not looking for necessarily firm, firm guidance from us, just a general direction. Maybe in the future, there would have to be a, a clearer policy that in fact, at the very least, every so many 10 years, for instance, a deep dive is required. But at this point, given the context of where we're in, it just wouldn't make sense to use resources unnecessarily. Correct. At this point, I just need a consensus from the commission as a whole that this uh, approach is is uh, consistent with the sort of the, the thinking of the commission. And we're all on the same page. So when we complete it, we're not uh, in a position where we have to go back and do something else. 
do you want to give any direction in terms of memorializing? It doesn't, it could be a memo, it could be, should it come to us publicly? I, no, it should come to us publicly. I want yes. this to be easily accessible to the public and the, the future commissioners to be able and to see what we did. And as Director Wells described it, I see it as short and concise, an overview of the process that was conducted and then the conclusions that were made. And to the extent that there was anything that did require a deeper dive, that that's flagged in the document. And this is on suitability only. only Correct. Right. And what I can do, I can work with Commissioner O'Brien so I can do a draft and work with her and make sure that that's consistent with her vision of, of how this would go. That, that's fine with me. And, and mm -hmm. so, okay. thank you. But, but there does appear to be a consensus emerging around the notion of parallel right. tracking mm -hmm. what procedures we currently do for the vendors right. when we do the renewals. Those just don't come in public, so that would be an added piece. Right. right. That's, that's agreeable with the IV. Okay. Yeah, I think your recommendation is entirely appropriate. So, nobody I, no one no. Do we need a formal vote, or can we just give so guidance you, on? Yeah, yeah we don't have a vote marked up, but I think you've got direction exactly. that you're I'm, seeking. I'm, I'm comfortable. Okay. Excellent. I got what I needed. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Good. So, Lord. And should we see if Attorney Grossman has anything to yes. say? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Attorney, Attorney Grossman. Are they turned to sign its head? Or? <clears throat> if you could uh, now elaborate on the rest of the process, that would be great. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I'll cut out my greetings and introduction. We'll move right into the, the meat of it. Um, so I think suitability is clearly an important part of any renewal process, but there are, of course, other elements that you'll want to consider in conjunction with that. Things like uh, some of the compliance with the license conditions, whether things are going well in the host and surrounding communities. You should consider things like, the, as they do in at least Pennsylvania, whether you want to conduct a hearing in, of sorts in the host community to allow for public comment of any kind. Um, and issues of, of that sort. So I think there are a number of other elements that we'll want to consider as we move forward in crafting some type of process. Um, though I think, uh, as, as discussed, the suitability is the cornerstone, really, of, of that, um, as it is in most other jurisdictions. So with that, if it's helpful, we can move into uh, some of the policy questions that have been posed and see if there's any consensus around some of that and of course if there isn't at this point that's okay as we're just going to really start crafting I think uh, some regulations if that's where everyone wants to go um, and we'll have another opportunity to modify those or and either even solicit uh, public input. So the first question really revolves around whether there should be a uh, fee for the renewal the statute actually does require a renewal fee. Um, in the case of uh, the initial fees, you'll recall they were $85 million, $25 million uh, respectively for category one and two. Um, the commission elected not to enhance that in any way so as to allow the licensees to put any additional funding into the buildings themselves. In our case now, the statutes actually say that any fee should be based on the cost of fees associated with the evaluation of the licensee. So it appears as though the statute did not contemplate any type of substantial relicensing fee, just that um, we would assess any costs associated with the suitability investigation or ho holding any hearings or, or things of that nature. Of course, we tax all of the uh, licensees on a daily basis and on an annual basis based upon the number of uh, gaming positions they have. So they are paying substantial fees to begin with and it does not appear as though the statutes contemplated assessing a, any kind of sizable uh, renewal fee. But that being said, uh, it, the commission does have some discretion in assessing some kind of fee here, um, at least in the uh, case of the category two, I believe it says the fee must be at least $100,000. So we can, we can start there. Of course, you don't have to identify a specific fee at the moment, but it'd be helpful just to gain an understanding of any thoughts you have on that. 
And the 100,000 is intended to cover the relicensing costs? Essentially, I think that's what it would go towards. But it, I think the $100,000 goes to the gaming to the game, revenue yes. fund, yeah. that's which right. gets divvied up to all the other various funds that penalties and you know taxes on gross gaming revenue. That's right. Too. So it's that's not right. actually money we see necessarily. That's a good point. Um, here and and you know uh, Todd covered it well, but uh, there's there is a slight distinction between the fee that the statute directs us to look at for category one and for category two. Uh, category one specifically says there's there's no um, minimum, but they say um, it needs to be to cover the costs of the investigation. Category two does set a minimum perhaps suggesting that the, that the investigation, this is perhaps, that the investigation for a category two might be less than a category one. I don't know if that's the case, but it, the statute does say the minimum to be 100,000 for category two. Um, and we can also infer that it is for the purposes of the investigation. But uh, am I correct that the, in, in terms of the category two, there is not a direct connection between whether that fee should be for the investigation? Well, no, actually, there, there is. In, in both cases, the statute, in different, so it's all somewhat disjointed. It doesn't say this all in one place. You have to piece it together from different sections. But okay. in both cases, category one and two, it does say that it has to be based upon uh, the cost associated with the investigation. Okay. So. And it looks as though, at least with respect to one, it, the renewal fee shall be exclusive of any subsequent licensing fees under this section. What does that mean, Tom? Do you know? Is that renewal fee? That would be, shall be exclusive of any the subsequent licensing fees. Which section are you in? I'm looking at footnote three, oh. page two. That, it's 23K 10D, section 10D. 10B. The commission shall pay so set any renewal for such license is based on the cost of fees for associated with the evaluation of the category one licensing. I'm not sure if the same language is available is on to two, do you know? I don't know. But I don't know what it means in terms of subsequent licensing fees. In other words, I did hear Commissioner Zunica say, you know, we do charge I think it was you, charge fees and taxes regular. Maybe it was you, uh, Todd, my mm -hmm. apologies, no, you, Commissioner. So, so did you. Um, so I think that they are suggesting that it's supposed to be exclusive to the other fees that we charge, whether right. our licensees love that or not. I think that's at least a fair way to look at it. Look we, at can, that one. we can take a closer look at that. It is subsequent. It's, it's, it's interesting that subsequent licensing fees, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there's, there's always been that dichotomy, you know, in which licensing fees apply to the initial ones, 85 and 25 million the individual ones, um, the right. renewal fees in this case. Uh, I, think, I think it suffice to say that there is a presumption that the fee be associated with the investigatory costs. Um, I think we, like, like initially, we, we would have the discretion if we wanted to set it higher. Um, but ultimately, I am of the same mindset as initially that if there was to be a cost benefit in terms of charging a fee up front or allowing the possibility of the licensee to invest in a longer term um, use of, of capital, whether it's in, in, in putting more amenities or doing more promotions, I would be more in favor of the latter, not the former. Um, this is just in parallel to what we decided at the very beginning where we did have the clear discretion for the initial fee to let to set it higher. Right. That the twenty five and the eighty five million dollar initial licensing fees were a floor and the statute expressly allowed us to to, to set it higher. Um, by then I am now of the mindset that um, a longer term view is more uh, uh, preferential and that charging anything up front in terms of just purely a fee comes at the expense of a longer term investment. Does it make sense though in terms of 
it looks as though it can't be less than 100000 for Category 2. Could we say the $100,000 plus any addition, any thing that exceeds that if it's a real cost in terms of the connection but otherwise it would just be the base can we could just that seems the most simple simple solution we can't go under a hundred thousand no right no on, uh, on there the, the floor is a hundred yes even if the costs were less it's assumed or I'm assuming that if the costs are higher just on the investigation that it would be that higher cost amount uh, to recoup the, the cost of that it investigation, it would be fair to the other licensees mm -hmm. because our other the, our costs to do those investigations, if we didn't charge them directly, would come out of yes. proportionately of the other two. So I think it's important to to um, uh, identify those costs, whatever they come out to be, 150 or whatever you know, whatever in excess of 100,000, yes. um, and just charge. Uh, um, Assess that on, on on the on the licensee in this case spend directly, but what I'm suggesting we don't do is go anywhere above yeah. those investigatory costs. So there's just an open question of the investigatory costs because we've set a dynamic of incorporating ongoing suitability reviews right. into this renewal, and so really we have a bigger question of determining those costs. How do we and is it simply the discrete task of renewal based on? mimicking the vendor form we just talked about? Or does it literally go back and look at anything tied to suitability of PEN? Mm -hmm. And what were the IEB costs associated with that? That number could drive that 100,000 number higher. Well, I, I would suggest, I, I understand the point, and it's a, it's a fair one. I, su I was assuming the former, just, you know, not the, not the latter. It would be I know, and a I was real, sort of, a real I, I exercise. I was thinking about the latter, so that's why I well, think we do have to have a broader I agree that we clearly have to be at least 100,000. I do think there has to be a broader discussion of what's the delta between those two numbers, and are we going to go over 100, and if so, how are we going to draw the line on cost? And well, let me, make sure, let me make sure I understand. We're, we're talking about the same thing. Um, I think it would be a, a, a really, you know, um, time consuming to try to go back in time and, and, and assess and, and try to figure out what costs, what investi investigatory costs uh, were driven by pen and pen only. Um, but we don't know the answer to that truly yet. That would be a question for IEB and whether they can do that quickly so, or not. Well, so, for instance, Commissioner O'Brien, when you asked how to memorialize how the suitability study is conducted, you asked Director Wells to memorialize that process. Right. For instance, they might include as part of that process what they learned during the REIT review. Correct. So, do oh. we take into consideration the costs? affiliated with the REIT, or do we only look forward? Right. Is that a fair example? Yes. Yeah. yes. I'm, I'm suggesting it would be too time consuming to try to ascertain those costs, because A, they're in the past, and I, and, and, and we already paid for them, which is fine, right. one way or another, um, but we would have to, and again, it would be a question to IV, but if they kept timesheets by activity, which I doubt they do, for example, and they spend all this time um, you know, at different times in a very long period of time, uh, investigating the read, uh, it would be difficult to ascertain unless it's they try to do it. Difficult, but not impossible. I mean, I've been in circumstances. Well, where why you don't do we get Director Wells to to, what, yeah, well, to assist with this and what they do track? Because I think they track right. costs very well. And I've been in situations of having to do it after the fact, and it is possible to get a ballpark. Right. So, uh, Commissioner O'Brien, did you complete your? I'm saying I've been in situations where we've been asked in my prior positions to do cost of prosecutions yeah, in either indemnification, in either investigative, and there is a way to recreate. It's a question of how accurate and how much time it takes. Right. So uh, Commissioner O'Brien's correct, and, and uh, Commissioner Zuniga is also correct. <laughs> so the, um, as a discrete example, the re review, we tracked all that. I don't know if the bill went out or not, but that is going to be billed. So that wouldn't be... Uh, that's already in process, so those that kind of thing. The um, sort of the regular check-in, uh, so like the SEC review, my time, I look at the litigation. Uh, that's going to have to would would necessarily have to be an estimate. So right. it's not as if there's documentation that would support that cost. So that that's a little trickier. And to do a historical analysis over the last five years on that. Uh, would potentially be 
difficult to do, and I'm not sure about the accuracy. We would probably have to lowball it, to be fair right. to the licensees. You could do some kind of estimate, uh, but it's not as if we have specific records on that, because that's just part of my day-to-day -day duties or an, like a financial I'm, investigator's duty. And just on that, you have the duties of the other two as well, right? You mean the just, other two licensees? Yes. Correct. Just like you're doing that with Penn, you're doing that with MGM and, 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 uh, and Wynn. And I would submit that perhaps it's proportional to the proportional bill that they all get. In other words, it would be, in my so opinion, our, our costs of your cost, salary. You're assessing, salary, you're right. assessing them currently proportionally. Correct. You are. The three. Um, and so, if we if we were to try to go back and true up these last five years, eventually. The other licensees might want to do the same, mm -hmm. and we might end up in a similar place. I mean, I think there's a there's a happy medium uh, here that you know, to the extent that there are real and reasonable um, direct estimates that we could go back in right. recent like time, the like the retransaction, like the retransaction, because a, for example, if we hired consultants and there was a real, you know, and I, I don't think we mm -hmm. we, we did, we but did. but 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 if we did, uh, that might be an easy. And, um, and as another example, you mentioned before, new qualifiers come in. Right. So we track all those expenses and we bill for those individually. So there, there's, for the most part, those are already tracked and already being billed. And then sort of that, that general overview is not necessarily tracked in that same, to that same level of detail. That's just part of my job, part of uh, our chief enforcement counsel's job, part of the you know the head of the financial investigation. That's part of the, sort of their day-to-day -day duty to have a sense, and that's just their job. So um, it's sort of both. Right. Commissioner Cameron, do you have some input? Uh, but I, I think whatever new costs associated yeah. with this particular investigation that is, not a problem. is very easily Correct. tracked. And yeah, we have a protocol for you that. You have okay. Well then. And and I think our licensees, not just PPC, but they've always acknowledged that certain amount of money gets you X, anything above and beyond that is going to come back out of your pocket. Right. So right. kind right. of operating under that assumption to begin with. Yeah. Kind I of think keeping that it fair based on what the additional work is, I think is fair. Yeah, and I think the um, the happy medium that you suggest com commission is, in, um, is possible um, <clears throat> because I don't think it would be entirely fair to not look back at all. Right. Mm -hmm. it, considering what we just give for, given for a directive, that we're going to use the past history right, right. and the past the work process. to actually support the renewal. So we can Fair come enough. up with that happy medium, I think. Yeah, but I can do something. This is again a work in process, so right. we would get some feedback and see how you're allocating those costs, and you know, we can look at them then because mm -hmm. you would come back to us for, for mm -hmm. guidance on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But does there, does there seem to be a, a, a consensus or agreement that we reserve the fee to uh, the cost of investigations and not try to increase that, which, which would be my recommendation if, if anybody wanted to? I, I would say that. tied to the co uh, cost of investigation that are related yes. to the suitability process mm -hmm. yes. whether it was well no the, the past, renewal process renewal, renewal suitability yes. but right. with respect to both looking back to the degree that's practical and then of course looking forward is the easy part mm -hmm. but so just the amendment of yep right so there may not be sort of a discrete it's because for example the discrete mm -hmm. the discrete bill may just be going forward or if we want to do some kind of estimate on uh, you know I'm familiar with a little a, Commissioner O'Brien's talking about the cost of prosecution. You go back and sort of figure out your time. That's mm -hmm. a little more challenging. We could do something in that respect, uh, but it would be a sort of a, uh, a lowball estimate. And then, um, but we wouldn't obviously double bill for the read analysis or double bill no. for, the, right. no. for the qualifiers. No. Exactly. So some of those are just already done. They're all done. Right. Exactly. Yeah, they would be credited effectively. Exactly. The other right. two exactly. would be credited yeah. Yeah. proportionately. Right. And it might be helpful to note that. Yeah. Karen, you know, these were already billed. We're not double billing, but this right. is all part of it, just so we understand the, mm -hmm. the cost. It might mm -hmm. be that, that through this process, it justifies the $100,000 and may not even exceed the $100,000, or it may well exceed the $100,000. It'll exceed the $100,000. It'll exceed the $100,000. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, but I do want to. Put it out there I, right now. <laughs> let's manage expectations. Yeah. 
but I do want to note to the, uh, right now is a good uh, point that they are very cost effective. The initial investigations that we did included a lot of consultants that by necessity charge by the hour, and I, there's a, a huge premium. Mm -hmm. uh, when we have our investigators in house, the you know, right. and, and that do a lot of it as a matter of course, and um, and with a really minimal these days use of outside help. Correct. Um, it is really rather cost effective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that enough guidance? Is that helpful on number one? I think that's helpful. <laughs> we can certainly craft some language around that discussion. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Number two. Two, uh, what will the term of the renewal be? The statute addresses this in part, and it has slightly different language for each of the licenses. The 15-year license um, says that the initial period shall be for a term of 15 years. In category two, uh, it says that the license shall be for a period of five years. So in theory, and this came up as an issue, so it's worth discussing, uh, even if it's only briefly, depending upon uh, people's sentiments on this, whether the renewal terms should likewise be 15, and, or if we're only talking about category two, five years, um, or whether there's any wiggle room to increase or decrease the term of the renewal uh, period. It seems to me that the statute contemplated that the renewal period be for a term of five years, but there is an argument that could be made if you wanted to, that it could be for something else. Yeah, I, I would take that kind of reading the legislative language, I think to your point, as an indication of we would expect no less than a five year renewal. And I would start there saying that, you know, renewal for the class two is five years. Um, but, you know, I'm having some thoughts of do we want to go beyond? I mean, we have a lot of tools and mechanisms available to us to pull back a license if for some reason the operator starts acting inappropriately or what have you, where we don't trust their operational skills or what have you. Um, but I'm comfortable with a minimum of five years. I don't know if we should go beyond that. Well, let me pick up on that because I'm, I'm the one who um, you know, think that we could be creative here or we could be uh, flexible if we read um, the, the language, um, you know, broadly for the following reason. And, you know, again, it, it's, 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 it's up to us. Um, I think there's, there's enough in the language that would direct for a renewal of five years. I think the reason to get it for something higher uh, would be almost as if we were conducting this, um, this bidding, if you will, this um, uh, negotiation. The one thing that we could offer to Penn in exchange for whatever they would be willing to do in terms of additional investment, let's say, is the term of the license being different than five years, being higher. Um, so whatever of value um, they might want uh, in terms of an, an additional capital investment, um, that is the only the only thing available to us. Um, I know I, I'm just saying, you know, maybe maybe you're not on board, but if we you said see me to that, shaking my head, I do. <laughs> uh, but if we were to say of, you know, let's say if if, if we offered a 10-year uh, um, renewal term, they might be willing to say, in exchange of that, I will do whatever. And it would be something that we could listen, uh, listen to. Uh, I, I'm not comfortable with that. I, 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 we are very new here in the Commonwealth. I'm very comfortable with the five-year take a look. These companies change so frequently um, that I would be comfortable with a five-year, and I don't think we should tie it to something they may offer. I just, I, I'm just not comfortable with that. I think, you know. Five years is a good amount of time, and then we'll take a look. We've already looked at a process that streamlines it, which I do agree with, but I, I just, I guess I'm just not comfortable with in any way. Um, I don't think there's a need to do that. It's yeah, no, it's, I, it's really a philosophical question. I think yeah. I'm, you know, coming from trying to extract value to the Commonwealth, um, I would, I would, you know, it's, it's a matter of saying that, again, um, 
what could they uh, uh, see of value um, that we could offer? I think it's really just that. Uh, if, if they were approved, anything else is really up to the legislature. You know, Actually, a, different, yeah. a, different, a different number of gaming positions, it's all written in statute. Um, table games, it's all limited to category ones. And, and, and it would be in going with the principle that was in statute as in you will get this privilege, the, the ability to run gaming, but in exchange you get a minimum capital investment, a licensing fee, and all these other things. Um, if we were taking that principle to the renewal process, and that, that is just what I'm suggesting. Um, by, by the way, I think it's a little creative myself. I think there is the way all of the sections um, in, in the statute come together. One could really just presume that it was intended to be a five-year renewal process. I wouldn't suggest going much um, longer than 10 years, for example. Um, and it may very well be that Ben would be in a position of saying, whether it's five or 10, if there's enough competition, whatever, uh, we're not willing to or able to put anything of value in terms of additional capital investment. I'm just. Yeah, Commissioner O'Brien, be um, before I comment, I just wondered if you. So I, I, I don't see quite the wiggle room legally to go beyond five necessarily, particularly at the first renewal. There had been some conversation that we had on, given the landscape, given the fact that the others were just up and running and we don't know what it's going to look like, even to the extent that we were going to consider something like that and it were legally feasible under the statutory structure, would it be more prudent to stick with five for the first renewal, consistent with the statute? And the idea that in the future you could possibly expand um, could be reserved in terms of the strict meaning, the plain reading of the statute, it shall be for five, consistent with the new landscape, we don't know what the dynamics and the impact are going to be with everyone getting live and possibly, you know, Regency also coming online. That is the prudent, cautious approach to say the statute says five, the landscape is changing. Five gives us the ability to, even if we want to consider what you're talking about, five years hence. later time. Absolutely. Yeah. So no, I'm, I'm of Commissioner Cameron's view that it, right now, where we stand and looking at the statute, I think five is the number. And if I could just add in, I, I think this is an interesting debate. Um, I do question if I were general counsel for one of our licensees, whether they would be comfortable with um, not having their license renewed at the expiration of five years because another, mm -hmm. there could be a challenge. An, a challenge to suggest that they are operating without a valid license. So right. there is a, 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 a very significant oh, piece. You mean five years from now? No, the minute that they didn't get renewed. Um, if we were to offer seven, it would, they would say, would they be we shown? view, our, and they might get an opinion from their own counsel to say, mm -hmm. with all due respect, Commission, we actually con are concerned that we would be operating without a proper license. Or, or, or perhaps more to that point, that a future Commission says, no, 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 that seven year or ten well, year so. was not, was but not I, okay, I think, you don't have one. You know, they're, you know, to the extent they're public companies, they would need to be insured very clear that their license is valid to, in order to mm -hmm. continue operating. So that's, I, of course, we haven't had this uh, discussion with any of our licensees, I presume, but I would say that given what I see in the statute, barring any other, you know, real clear conclusion from um, our, our legal and even outside counsel on this, I would say that we're probably confined to five years uh, however we would like maybe to interpret the language uh, because we could put our, our licensees a bit at risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm comfortable with the five years. I think it's consistent. I think it gives our licensees some um, expectations of knowing what the landscape is. Five years, we had the initial five, we'll have the second five. Um, I think, I think I don't want to say it's a safe bet, but I think it, it's <laughs> logical and gives them a level of confidence. Oh, I yeah, do no, like creativity, I, though, Commissioner. I just felt it was important to, yeah. as a yeah. threshold uh, topic, to identify that, um, you know, if we were in, in, a, in a principle of, of bidding of sorts, of, of, of asking what were they able to to give in return, again, for the benefit of the Commonwealth, we should just discuss. But it's, it really sounds like there's a, there's a majority uh, or a unanimous uh, building. I was 
on the fence on this, um, and uh, we can we can just presume that it should be a five-year term. But I want to pick up on your point and to think about this maybe as part of the process. Is I think there's kind of two pieces here that I think we should think about. One is we're going on the expectation PPC wants to be renewed. I think we need to have some type of trigger that they tell us they want to go through a renewal process. Um, but secondly, think of you know the process where we will be hearing from IEB and an updated suitability. I would give our licensees a chance to say this, I think to your point, this is what we want to do over the next five years. Um, not just have this be a rubber stamp approval of a mm -hmm. license, have them give us an opportunity to hear what they plan to invest, uh, because they do have a reinvestment requirement, but also what their plans are maybe for staying competitive in, in this marketplace. Mm -hmm. Give them a chance to pitch themselves as, as part of us giving them a renewal. Yeah, I think it's, it's a fair, be, uh, first, uh, fair assumption to assume that they want a license renewal. They signed a 20-year lease on that building. Uh, and we know 20, the town. 20 or? We know the town is going to pay revenue. It's yeah. be there. <laughs> it was, you know, so they, they would owe a big amount of rent if they, if they didn't get a renewal. Uh, but um, but in, in, in following with, you know, um, the, the, the principle of, uh, you know, A, documenting, but B, um, uh, making them uh, put on the record what they are assuming or willing to do going forward, I think is really important, an important part of the process. Maybe this leads nicely into uh, point three in your memorandum, because the different policy questions mm -hmm. that we want to consider. Is, do you feel you have guidance on number two that I think there was clarity on that <laughs> point, so yes. Uh, point three, I think, is really the heart of the matter, which is what exactly do you want to look at as part of this renewal process? You've obviously opined on the suitability of the individuals and entities uh, designated as qualifiers. That's a, a key component to all of this, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also, of course, and you touched on this, and uh, Commissioner Zuniga mentioned it, in a specific context, there's the financial suitability of the overall entity, which is uh, likely an important uh, consideration as well. Uh, things like the overall health and capitalization of the parent company, uh, the debt equity ratios and things of that nature, uh, which are I, uh, things that are, are looked at on an ongoing basis, but things that you should also likely take a look at uh, during this renewal process. Um, and things that probably don't take a lot of further evaluation. The evaluation may already have been done, um, but just that a report on it uh, would be something to consider as part of the renewal. But then there are other issues that, again, are things that the commission and staff have been looking at on an ongoing basis, but things you may want to consider specifically as part of the renewal, like compliance with all of the licensing conditions that were assessed um, upon the award of the initial licenses, just taking a holistic uh, look at those to ensure that there are no gaps. Uh, the compliance with the host and surrounding community agreements, whether you want some type of uh, communication with the host and surrounding communities to uh, get their take on all of this, whether, as I mentioned before, you want to conduct any hearings uh, and solicit public input on any of this. These are all things that some other jurisdictions uh, do when reviewing uh, renewal applications. There's the capital expenditure plan, which is um, something that each of the licensees are required to do. Uh, PPC and Penn National have a multi-year plan that was approved by the commission, I'm going to say two years ago or so, which covered a five-year term. Um, it is looked at on an annual basis to ensure that they're compliant with it, but it would be perhaps a good time to look at it as part of the renewal process to ensure that it is where you want it uh, to be. And with, so with all that, there are a wide variety of uh, topics that you may wish to consider as part of this renewal process. And uh, we can include as many or as few of them um, in the uh, regulations as you wish. The only one that is 
interestingly not subject to debate is compliance with the ILEV agreements, which the statute says you must consider as part of your renewal process. And remind me, did they have any ILEV? Um, I believe so, with um, Rentham and uh, mm -hmm. places like that. I think they have actual agreements in okay. place. The Rentham outlet's not the town of Rentham. Yeah. I actually think all of your, um, all of your um, elements that you point out here uh, look appropriate for review as part of this process. And I actually like the idea of a public hearing. We do it with racing reviews. It makes a lot of sense. You hear from people. They get a chance to talk about what they like or don't like. Um, and I think that is an important piece. Yeah, and that is, um, I think, um, fundamentally a really good um, way to have the licensee put forth what they're proposing, what they're yes. willing to do, if anything different, not just their history and, and compliance at a summary level, mm -hmm. but also um, what what their perspective, just like any racing application that we get year after year, um, uh, puts forward. Um, Anything missing from the list? It's hard to think of what might be omitted. Yeah, the, the only thing I would go back and focus on is um, give some thought to the review of the RFA2 application, which I know is you talk about that, but it's also folded in. I think everything that was in the RFA2 became part of the overall license. Um, you know, maybe not a formal process, but you know, each commissioner, you know, we, three of us worked on different parts of that RFA2 application, maybe just going back to those, reviewing them and, and using those for whatever questions we might have to pose to, uh, in this case, PPC as part of the public hearing with not a public input hearing but a public discussion with PPC with respect to their renewal. Yeah. You missed this or you didn't do this or you shifted course from the RFA2 to where we are now. Let's have a conversation. Do you think that's something that we have to mandate or is that just part of what individual commissioners would deem uh, appropriate materials in order to prepare? I feel comfortable leaving it to the individual commissioners, but that's what I'm thinking you know, as well. Because I do to believe all point, we're trying to memorialize, right. memorialize this process. But it each of those more. elements were were captured in the license conditions. Mm -hmm. Is that your best recollection? They were, and and I would think as part of any renewal process, you would want to. Re you all the license conditions for compliance and mm -hmm. for additional conditions if you thought that was appropriate. Right. Yeah. And we, we should remember that we did um, what was initially supposed to be a mid-term review that turned into more like a three and a half year <laughs> review <laughs> but for, for important reasons, uh, um, not because we were late, um, where, you know, that was um, at a time where we also recalibrated some uh, initial conditions, um, where there was perhaps an aspirational goal that was uh, based on different set of circumstances that needed to be lowered for, again, for good reasons. It was not that like, like we just agreed, we really tested the, the reasons and the efforts um, that they had undertaken. I, I would imagine a similar process uh, if, if it's needed. Um, I, uh, the only back to your question, um, um, Chair. I, um, the only thing that I would um, just clarify in, in what I think is really a comprehensive set of bullet points, where it comes to the the topics uh, on, uh, as part of the uh, renewal um, analysis, uh, is on the second to last, the financial suitability, which I mentioned earlier, that it be um, perhaps uh, focused um, on the property level not necessarily on the company level, which we have done, and we're, I mean, we could, we could do the company level as well uh, as a refresh, uh, but what I, what I think is most uh, relevant for us anyway, uh, especially as, it, as, it, um, as this process moves forward um, into a, a, what is now a competitive, a very different phase than the initial term. When, when, um, when Penn started with this um, license, they were 
Uh, they had a, a clear period in which they were going to be the only ones operating in the Commonwealth, and that had a set of conditions that really mixed into the financial um, picture. Um, they uh, they know that it's a very different. Everybody knows that it's a very different uh, competitive landscape uh, as this next second second set of uh, the next five year period, and um, and it is in that context that I would just myself would like to understand or work with um, the IEB financial investigators to get a, a, a you know a picture of. Um, their financial uh, condition going forward at the property level. Just to clarify, would would you want it, um, at some degree a review of the parent company as well, but also the focus on the property? In other words, both, yes. but with focus on the local property. Yep. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I know because of the midterm <coughs> review they put together um, really helpful summary level reports to their own corporate executives that is that rolls up into their financials from the property level it is it is that that I'm referring to yeah. mm -hmm. just um, to add to what's already been made about the us having a meeting on this where we can hear from um, interest other than ourselves and the licensee I do think that that's critical a it's transparency to the process and B it also allows thoughts and suggestions that we might want to put in as conditions that maybe people that are on the receiving and sending end of regulating this industry might not think of. I do think it's critical um, to do that. So whether it's one or more, I think there's at least one that we mm -hmm. have to do. Public hearing. Yes. yes. Agreed. We had a public hearing by statute in the first time around, and we did actually a host community hearing that was the statutory one. We also did a surrounding community hearing in some instances, because there was so much interest, we ended up doing that over um, multiple days. Uh, but I think a similar process might be also right. well received. I mean, it could be satisfied in one, but mm -hmm. to your point, if we get there and there's simply not enough of an opportunity okay. for anyone who wants to be heard to be heard, we should be open to the idea of doing more. Right. Agreed. A minimum of one. Yeah. Right. Yes. I think, I think that makes sense and we'll definitely work that in. I think it's also important to remember there's an interesting dichotomy that emerges as we talk about this as it pertains to the Category 2 license and that is that you will, as was mentioned earlier, review the Category 2 license about three times before you review the Category 1 once. Right. So there should be some consideration to migrating some of these uh, elements over to category ones in some format, mm -hmm. even though you won't be going through a formal renewal process. So uh, I, that's just one of the things that strikes me as we go through these discussions. I mean, like potentially having public meetings to well, hear input just as a, at a midway point or five years out. Something to think the about. Um, yep. In yeah. Interim review. Whether it's that or, just or, or any of period right. or open comment, whatever. Yeah. Well, the. Um, the renewal forms that we just talked about, um, we don't have to wait uh, 15 years to get a refresh on the category ones for 14 <coughs> years. Because we'll be suitability is ongoing. Yep. But it's, it's a good mechanism to mm -hmm. kind of keep, keep that uh, fresh. Mm -hmm. Again, not necessarily part of the category two process, but really bleeds into whether we should consider it for the category one. Right. That's very helpful. I think we can uh, get started on preparing uh, a set of regulations that capture all of these uh, comments and sentiments. And, and remind me again of the timing because I'm thinking, of course, uh, public hearings, the calendar, mm -hmm. it, <clears throat> just so that we can start to plan. Well, the, um, the Plain Ridge Park Casino license expires on June 24th, uh, 2020. Mm -hmm. So, sometime before that. Yeah. <laughs> to be responsive, <laughs> on the early side of the new year, mm -hmm. we would, I would think we'd want to get the public input, correct? Right. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Right. Thank you. Um, the final question um, just to throw out is that the statute does talk about, at least in the context of the Category 1s, that if there are any issues the Commission believes need to be sent to uh, the legislature for consideration for amendment to any statutes that we do that. 
Um, it says 180 days before the expiration of the first license. Um, so if there's, I, there's nothing that comes to mind for me, but if there's anything um, that we think will serve as a roadblock of any kind, there's an invitation in the statute to send it to the legislature. There's nothing that comes to my mind, especially after the discussion we had. If, for example, we had a different views as to the term, that would be one thing to perhaps get legislative uh, direction. But um, I although that is a different point, because yeah. I think I don't think we were necessarily. I, I think to Commissioner Cameron, you were actually thinking five years seems to be the right snapshot. Oh yeah, I and was. Where, that. Yeah, you were thinking that. Yes. Where. I don't know, um, Commissioner O'Brien, but I was thinking that the statute limits us. So if yeah, no, the no. legislature changed it, of course, that would give, that would address my concerns. But well, but but, and, and I'm making the point that I think we're, we're all set on that. Okay. I, I I think we don't we don't need a legislative uh, recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, there have been, as part of the political process, uh, proposals that are entirely out of our hands that are. Uh, up there in the legislature, and they can take them or not. That would affect uh, potentially uh, these 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 license um, or these licensee rather. But you know, if we are focusing on like we did on what we clearly have here, which is you know the fee, the renewal term, uh, the conditions, um, mm -hmm. additional if any, as well as the suitability. I think we are really covered. Consensus at this juncture, yes, we have nothing. Or four, excellent. Thank you. Nicely done. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very Thank thoughtful you. memo. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Really important work. So thank you. Perhaps five minutes break. You would like. We're going to break for uh, five minutes, uh, and this will allow folks to transition. The next stop will be Ombudsman Ziamba. Thanks so much. We're re uh, reconvening our meeting. Uh, item number five, Ombudsman Ziemba, please. Thank you very much, Chair and Commissioners. I'm joined here today by Joe Delaney, Construction Project Oversight Manager. Uh, first on the agenda is the beginning of the process for the 2020 Mitigation Fund Application Guidelines. Um, earlier this year, we announced Community Mitigation Fund Awards pursuant to the Commission's 2019 guidelines. Uh, the item before you today is the beginning of the process for approving the guidelines for the next year's program. Uh, by statute, applications by communities and other governmental entities are due to the Commission no later than February 1st of each year. In order to give communities time to put together their applications, we plan to issue the final guidelines uh, for the uh, 2020 program no later than the beginning of December. Uh, and that should give applicants approximately two months to put together their applications. Uh, applicants can also t use the period between now and the, and the um, issuance of the new guidelines to put together their applications as well, uh, because undoubtedly, even though we will make some changes, uh, the guidelines will, will look fairly similar to last year, I would predict. So in order to uh, solicit input and advice on these guidelines, as we do every year, we reconvene uh, meetings of the local community mitigation advisory committees and then the subcommittee on community mitigation. Uh, and also we plan to hopefully have a meeting with the gaming policy advisory committee. These committees include uh, appointees of the host communities, surrounding communities, regional planning agencies, the Mass Municipal Association, Department of Revenue, uh, and others to provide very valuable in, uh, advice and input. And we thank them all for uh, all of their input to date. Um, we're hoping to have two meetings of each of those groups, except only one meeting of the, of the GPAC. Uh, we have already had our first meeting in the Region A LCMAC, uh, and we had one meeting of the Subcommittee on Community Mitigation uh, to date. So in order to make these meetings as useful as possible, we annually develop a list of uh, items that the committees could discuss. Um, the memo is in your packet. Um, we, that memo has a number of different questions that staff 
uh, have identified based on last year's practice and things that we uh, understand the commissioners would like to review and, and we anticipate communities would like to review. So uh, my goal uh, for today is just to understand if there are additional questions that commissioners have uh, that we should explore as we develop the guidelines. Uh, we anticipate coming before the commission at least two times more uh, on the guidelines by the beginning of December, uh, once to report back on, on the input and to come up with the draft guidelines and then one to finalize such guidelines. Um, we plan to bring the first draft to the commission at the, at the next commission meeting and then following the commission's approval, uh, hopefully of the draft, our practice is to post the draft guidelines for public comment so today is just designed to get a consensus on the list of questions to explore as we put together our draft of the guidelines. Of course, if individual commissioners have any questions beyond today's meeting, um, you know, we'll obviously take those into consideration when we come up with the draft guidelines. So uh, we don't anticipate trying to answer any of these questions today. I won't go over, over every question on the list. Um, although we really try to slim the document down this year, it is still rather voluminous. Uh, but I will highlight just a few of the bigger items that we'll take into consideration as we put together our, our draft documents. Uh, one is workforce uh, program pilots. Uh, as the Commission knows, uh, for the last three years we've had pilots. Um, and I think that they've been really pretty successful to date. Um, I won't go into details about those successes. I know that uh, Director Griffin as an item on the agenda for a little bit later and she can give you just at least a couple sentences about our history to date regarding the workforce programs uh, but they continue to be probably some of our most popular uh, programs in all of our committee meetings and also um, given the circumstances uh, on hiring both in the east and in the west they they really do seem like we would we will need to continue those but again you know we're not answering any questions today we're just uh, coming up for those considerations. Uh, one other uh, big item that we'll take a look at is whether or not we should utilize mitigation funds for the construction of transportation projects. As the Commission is aware, uh, our funds can be used for the design and permitting of, of transportation projects, uh, but to date we have not utilized uh, our funds for the actual construction of transportation projects. Now, um, I think it's quite obvious that uh, we could not pay for all of the costs of some of the very, very large transportation projects that are out there. So uh, we need to figure out how we could, if we do choose to move in that direction, how we could play a part uh, in a funding strategy for some transportation projects that would benefit the regions. Uh, one other thing that we'll take a look at is what operations related uh, impacts should be addressed. We now have uh, fully operational category one facilities uh, by the time of next year's application we'll have about a year and a half under our belts for MGM Springfield and about a half a year's worth of activities out at Encore so by that time we we certainly won't see all of the impacts that will develop but potentially we may see some uh, of the uh, impacts out here in the east and we'll learn a little bit more about some of the impacts occurring out in the west uh, we obviously do benefit from all of the studies that are taking place. Uh, we just had a report last week regarding some of the real estate issues uh, out in the West, and we have some public safety reports that we, um, uh, before the Commission, I believe, in the beginning of November. Um, so in regard to the operational re requirements, one thing that we will take a very careful look at is what public safety needs should be addressed and how should we uh, how should we put that into the guidelines? Uh, so we'll take a look at that and hopefully we'll get a little more input by the time we come up with our drafts. Uh, but obviously there have been significant funds put into place um, both by the facilities and by the host communities. Uh, but are there additional needs that we should take a look at? Uh, during this past year there was a request by one community uh, to have some funding for late night patrols. Uh, because it didn't meet the, the guidelines uh, last year. We weren't able to fund that, but that prompted us to take a look at what, we sh sh what should we think about for this upcoming year. So uh, with that as uh, a general overview, uh, one thing I will get into a little more depth on uh, at the next commission meeting 
is the, the sort of dollars and cents of the program. Uh, we're in the process of putting together our estimates for next year's program based on the revenues that have been coming into the fund so far this year. And uh, I'd like to get into a little bit more depth about what we're projecting for next year for the overall program. So with that, I ask if the commissioners have any questions or I turn it to Joe if he wants to add something. What was the last point you made, John, about um, the amounts available? You were going to take that at a later meeting? Yeah, so when, okay. when we present the guidelines, what I think I'll go into some depth about is yeah. the anticipated level of funding for next year's uh, mm -hmm. potential program, what's available, what's being put into the fund now, yep. uh, because it provides a context of what we could utilize for, for expanded programs or continuation mm -hmm. of existing programs. Yep. At that time, to, will you be addressing the tools that you use for outreach and um, <clears throat> to encourage really substantive, excellent applications. You've gotten that in the past, but uh, presuming that there's going to be more funding, will you be addressing that at that juncture, or is that a, a I wonder something I, for I me? I could answer, take a shot at okay. that now. So um, I referenced the committee meetings that we have, right. uh, both in the east and in the west, these local community meetings. And so we have representatives from all the uh, surrounding communities and the host communities. And so what we do is we go over these um, guidelines in depth so that they can understand what goes into a successful application. We give them a little bit of a flavor of uh, what would be a successful application. You know, as Joe uh, likes to say uh, in the past, probably the biggest thing that we have to take a look at is whether or not the grant that's being requested relates to impacts being caused by the casino. Uh, there are a lot of great projects out there. We've seen a lot of great projects come our way but uh, we have to satisfy that nexus for the statute. So we have the local meetings. We publish uh, these guidelines for, for public comment. There are numerous, numerous groups that I mentioned um, that have a lot of expertise and uh, they do their own outreach. Uh, Mass Municipal Association has done okay. its outreach in the past of these guidelines and hopefully we'll get to legislators and others as part of our GPAC process, but we have the public input as well through um, um, uh, uh, that we do the public comment period as well. And Elaine, that would be also something that we could really use our social tools for that. Okay, great. Thank you. But, but we're not suggesting that we relax that requirement of the grants being tied to the impacts coming gotcha. from the casino, right? No, 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 no. I guess w what I mean by that is when we try to educate Yes. Um, all of our com committee members and communities Thank you. that we we repeat that and repeat mm -hmm. that and repeat that yes. sort of ad nauseum. But yeah. That it's a statutory requirement. So statutory without requirement. that, the application will fail. Co that is correct, and that is the uh, main reason why applications have uh, failed. Disqualified. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I have some I, some reactions to some of the you know. Some of the comments. Maybe uh, I don't know if they, if a couple of the points that I have uh, would be into guidelines, but I think it's a good, perhaps, topic of discussion. Um, and one is, um, or the first one in that rubric is to eventually give more discretion to staff to manage what is becoming, a, a, you know, a necessity of um, of a grant program, uh, and that is perhaps slight cost overruns or maybe an initial budget that changes a little bit uh, and it's still related. Um, I don't know if we want to call it a contingency or again a discretion. Um, the amount of um, uh, the votes that we have had to take uh, as a result of, of, um, of changes are really minimal but I think uh, um, it's not really us that I'm worried about. It's the, the resources that it might take you here internally and then locally in trying to figure out and go back and forth uh, between whether that whether a cost or, a, or an item was really what was approved and whether we would have to bring it up back to us 
or uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, I'm not sure that that goes in the guidelines. I'm just putting it out there. Um, but if it's a 10% contingency or something to that effect, some kind of threshold that under under which uh, you guys can have the discretion as you see fit, uh, and above which you would have to bring it back to us. That's just something that I think might be really helpful as this program builds in terms of significance. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I, I think that might be something we, we might want to bake into the, the guidelines as well uh, for, for next year. And maybe even if we have a reason uh, or need for this year, maybe we could bring that separately up during the course of this year uh, to the commission. Um, you'll, you'll see an item a little bit later on today uh, that is up for consideration by the commission where it is literally the movement of a couple thousand dollars from one account to the other account. Mm -hmm. And we felt that we needed to bring it back to the commission because we initially brought the three or four thousand uh, dollar change to the commission. And since it grew in costs, I didn't believe that we had the authority or we should move forward without it, at least informing the commission. Mm -hmm. But those are the types of things that they do require a lot of back and forth between us and our grantees um, and even you know, arguments or disputes between staff members. Do we really need to do this? It's such a de minimis expense. Um, so it does take some time. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, certainly the, the commission acts pretty, pretty darn quickly on all of these requests. But uh, sometimes it does take a little bit more to get to the commission mm -hmm. um, on some of these items. So that might be something worth consideration. Yeah, and, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm more worried about what does happen or does not happen locally as a result of just the necessity of having to consult with us every two weeks, let's say, with a, with a time, with a window yeah. of, you know, within, within the next two weeks. Um, the somebody. only thing I would say on that is I'd be more comfortable with a de minimis dollar threshold yes. than a percentage because if we're going to be handing out grants of a significant amount, yeah. I would want to know about it before they mm -hmm. changed it um, rather than a sort of, a, as you're talking about de minimis, 1,000, 2,000, that's different than a percentage. I'm not so sure I feel comfortable with a percentage. That's good. Yeah, no, I'm... And, and that's, consistent like with, that. that's consistent with contracting practices. Right. You know, there'd be a... a a dollar right minimum change really good a good suggestion and good point <coughs> and, and by the way if if any if uh, you know any changes are required that the staff feels is not the original approval they that that always is assumed to come back to us or right. come back you know to a next right you know you'd always have the discretion to you'd come always back have to, to us. Right. yes you, you, right. you know, as you'll see from Director Griffins, we err on the side of bringing it back to you, where even though it was approved by the commission, the documents were in the packet, it may not have been obvious in some of our presentations what the actual story was. So if there's an item in there today that uh, mm -hmm. um, may not be needed to come to the commission, but we thought we should. It's just something to consider that, yep. I, that, that you know, I think could give you flexibility. The program is going to get harder and harder to manage because it's going to grow. Uh, and we've been very, um, uh, very diligent because, especially the first few years, because there was only one source of funding, the licensing fee, that had to last through the construction years. Now there's going to be a, more of a rhythm with the monies that come from the operations. Uh, and I think it's only a, something to consider. Uh, the other thing that I uh, wanted to mention is, I don't know if we're ready for it this uh, time around, but it's something that we've put off, and that is the notion of a multi-year uh, grant. Uh, if we're considering, again, perhaps with subject to resubmission or re, re, um, um, reapproval or whatnot, but our our mechanism has been one only limited to um, to a year, uh, even though there have been a couple of projects that span more than more than a year. Uh, but again, as if we're thinking of eventually putting larger grants out there, because we're now thinking whether they could, they could be uh, in conjunction with other funding sources for construction projects, for example, uh, I think we're, we're going to be in the need to contemplate the possibility of multi-year uh, grants. Um, yeah, just to reflect on that, um, one of the big conversations that we've been having at the committee level is for larger transportation projects, obviously, as I mentioned, we cannot pay for big costs. And if we do pay for big costs, they would have to be over a number of years where we could pay a, a 
not a little mm -hmm. bit, but a sizable amount out of each year's grant over a good period of time. Uh, and how does that work? And if someone is bonding for the mm -hmm. overall cost of the transportation project, can they rely on our funds because we have to make these determinations each year? Um, and we can't, we don't know for certain uh, what our revenues are going to be for the upcoming year. We don't know for certain even um, other aspects regarding the licensees and the licenses. Indeed, they're all subject to uh, commission action. Mm -hmm. So there, there's some risks that we have to really think about, and we are working on it. Yeah, no doubt. And, and, and um, if, we, if we ever get to a multi-year option, um, I would be very much in, in favor of having really um, um, that be a small percentage of the overall grant consideration. I wouldn't want us to go, you know, committing most of the funding or, or even a, a majority of the funding available for one year because by definition, the funding to this fund is going to fluctuate. There's going to be That's some right. variability. Um, so whatever, whatever commitment we make at any given point, you know, has the certainty of taking away, you know, future year uh, available funding. But I think now looking back at this program, we have had uh, a real focus on planning grants mostly, and those, those have been very helpful. Right. But um, if there's really a need out there, and there are some good examples, um, uh, there's, there's the, 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 the notion that we should be thinking towards, you know, expanding that, that, that funding. Um, the final point I wanted to make is uh, perhaps, I don't know if you alluded to it or if this is a sentiment to the, um, to the, what you're getting in terms of feedback from the local com committees, um, but I think uh, um, when it comes to operations or, or, or trying to address operational impacts that we, like we have done before, we begin to get a feel for what those are before we put out, you know, a, a, a commitment of any kind um, in, in, in the guidelines. I'd rather us let that process be organic, not very similar to what we uh, experienced through, through, through the construction uh, phase. Um, those needs are going to begin to, you know, identify themselves, and I'd rather much have that intelligence rather than trying to make, um, you know, um, assumptions as to what would be an impact before really seeing them. And I'm just, I'm just, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just uh, agreeing with, uh, or, or, or say, you know, with perhaps what you said, or the, the practice that we certainly have had, which is, well, let's let's just wait and see um, when it comes to some of these operational impacts. And uh, along those lines. Um, I did mention that we try to take advantage to a lot of the research reports whenever they are available so we can ascertain what impacts are housing, public safety, and the like. And over the course of this next year as well, we will have the advantage of a lot of the traffic studies uh, for MGM and uh, for Encore. Uh, indeed, um, Plain Ridge just completed another traffic report. So even some of those impacts will be better known. Commissioner? I just, as always, very thoughtful work. Um, the committees are obviously working well and coming up with good ideas. So it just uh, um, lots of interesting questions to to consider moving forward. Here. Commissioner, I would like to note that uh, I did notice a typo in uh, the memo on the first page. Uh, I think the commissioner remembers that we awarded approximately 4.1 million dollars yes. in grant funding for this past year. And so, but um, the the number in the in the the bolded text, the commission awarded a total of instead of 3.682, that should be 3.882, and then over and above that is the 200,000 that we had from the tribal grant, and then a 75,000 in reserve, totaling to the 4.1. Mm -hmm. But that's a typo in there, that 3.682. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And building on Commissioner Cameron's um, point, I'm. <clears throat> In terms of the process, the committees, are you finding that there, I mean, the local committees, are, are you finding that there's easy consensus or 
Were there any asks that you would have liked to have entertained that just didn't really meet the statutory demands or the past policy uh, requirements? Or? Uh, no, I, I do. I think we find these committees extremely useful. We're really trying to uh, struggle with a lot of the details. A lot of the members have been meeting with us for a good number of years. So uh, folks remember uh, what we discussed last year, for example, on the transportation construction item. We chose not to have a general transportation construction item. We had one exception, which was a transit project of regional significance, which was sort of a pilot program. Uh, but people realized why we didn't make, why we made the decision last year on transportation construction, and that we're having the same conversations this year. So, but we may open it up, and I think folks are. Uh, they understand the constraints that we're under, and uh, but the potential for the program as as we get new revenues in, and indeed this upcoming year we will have some significant new revenues. Everyone all set? Any um, qu further questions, comments? Thank you. I think we're moving on now to item five B on the appointments. Great. Thank you. Uh, so next up, uh, commissioners, is a request for reappointment of several members to the local community mitigation advisory committees and committees, uh, subcommittees under the Gaming Policy Advisory Committee. Uh, the local community mitigation advisory committee of reappointments, I've included biographies of the appointees that were provided to you last year. Uh, we are recommending the following reappointment for the Region B, LCMAC, Ellen Potashnik. Uh, for one of the two human service provider appointees. We are actively working on the remaining Region B representatives uh, and may uh, have one or more, more recommendations for you by the next meeting. Uh, I thank Commissioner Stebbins for all of his assistance in reaching out for some of these new members. Uh, for the Region A LCMAC, we are again recommending uh, Vincent Panzini as the Chamber of Commerce representative Mr. David Bancroft as the Regional Economic Development Representative, and Myra Negron Rivera as the Human Service Representative for Region A. We still have one more Human Service Representative open position in Region A. Uh, so we're very pleased that these very qualified individuals helped us over this past year and uh, that they have agreed to continue to help us. Uh, in prior years, we recommended that these appointments should be at the pleasure of the Commission uh, in addition to these appointments, the commission also needs to appoint a commission representative for the subcommittee on community mitigation, a representative on the public safety subcommittee, and also a representative on the uh, subcommittee on addiction services. Commissioner Stebbins and Commissioner uh, Cameron uh, were appointed by the commission to the community mitigation subcommittee and the public safety subcommittees respectively uh, last year. Last year, the Commission appointed Mark Vanderlyn into the Addiction uh, Services Subcommittee. As you know, uh, Mark and Commissioner Zaniga uh, have been actively involved in the I issues of relevance to this subcommittee. So I will turn it to a, a discussion by the Commission regarding either the reappointments to the LCMECs or to gauge interest by Commissioners for the appointments to the subcommittees. I'd, I'd like to turn first to the um, Community Mitigation Advisory Subcommittee where you're recommending Commissioner Stebbins. I understand, Commissioner Stebbins, you are interested in continuing and if I, do we get to, we get to vote? Would you like to vote on? So we have some votes in, included in your packet. I think it's framed as one should, vote. We should have a motion that covers all of them. So to the extent that you are comfortable with that, that's fine. To the extent that you want to amend that motion, that, that motion, that's fine. Okay, but in any case, I would I would recommend, and we can vote uh, uh, comprehensively that uh, Commissioner Stebbins continues in that work. Uh, his commitment is clear. Happy to do that. Yeah, I, I, is that a motion, or should I make the motion? Well, I think it would be nice to do it on an individual basis. To okay, to I, I would I would uh, move that we. Um, Reappoint Commissioner Stebbins to that to that role with uh, uh, mitigation. Do I have a second? Second. Any further discussion or questions for Commissioner Stebbins? Any further nominees? Hearing none. Um, all in favor? 
Aye. 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 And uh, you're abstaining, Commissioner Stebbins, so four um, uh, approvals and one abstention. Thank you. Commissioner Cameron, you have served in this capacity mm -hmm. um, as the chair of the Public Safety Committee. Subcommittee, do you wish to discuss your experience? I do. Um, um, it's, been, it's been a worthwhile um, experience. I've served since the beginning with, uh, with that. By the way, the, uh, I was the representative from the commission and the Public Safety Committee then in turn voted me in to chair. And um, it's, it's been, I think we've done good work. They've added uh, excellent value. I think moving forward, there's even more value to be added by this group because we really now have casinos up and running and we have public safety issues that need to be addressed. So I think moving forward, um, this uh, public safety committee will be of even greater value. Um, having served in this capacity, I would like for discussion purposes and then a motion, uh, I really think Commissioner O'Brien would add great value to public safety. She, like me, has a public safety background, and I believe um, this would be an appropriate time for a transition and to, um, to have Commissioner O'Brien serve in that capacity with public safety. Um, and, and I will gladly make that motion uh, to have her serve in that capacity. And by the way, I'm not hitting her cold. We have discussed this. She has been a valued <laughs> member. She's come to meetings. She's added great value. But now to, tra uh, to officially transition as a chair, I think, would be appropriate. If I could just add in uh, to compliment Commissioner Cameron's um, recommendation. First off, it, and I did jump in ahead of my fellow commissioners because um, I just wanted to first, before we discuss this, very good recommendation that we have to acknowledge Commissioner Cameron's leadership, extensive experience and expertise in public safety and what she has brought in terms of her leadership to that very important subcommittee. Um, we are extremely fortunate that uh, <clears throat> three appointing officials had the wisdom to appoint Gail to that position, recognizing what she brought. Um, <clears throat> to this commission with respect to her extensive law enforcement background. And I know that with that experience, but also your leadership, you have garnered the uh, respect of all of the local public officials, particularly the, uh, the uh, law enforcement community, uh, <clears throat> and, and given the work um, here, uh, really the um, gravity that it deserves, but also you've achieved a collaboration that's really uh, significant and unique. So uh, I want to wish publicly um, you know, my personal gratitude and also, if I can, the gratitude of all of my fellow commissioners for your leadership. And of course, leadership recognizes that sometimes a transition mm -hmm. is important. And Commissioner O'Brien was appointed by the Attorney General in the public safety capacity and brings an extensive um, background in, um, as a prosecutor and a great deal of um, varied <clears throat> state and legal experience which will help her in that role if we go forward. Now I'll let you elaborate if you wish. Well, I think that's a great summary. I mean, uh, the, the, the one thing that I would highlight uh, of your remarks is that uh, you brought uh, very important key players to the table um, which is very relevant later. It'll come to um, the example of what we have not been able to do in the, in the Addiction Services Subcommittee. But the point is that that's a key piece of this. Uh, I hope that you will continue to, to, um, to help in those efforts. Um, you know, it's, it's this, um, uh, again, bringing the, the players that sometimes have, well, not sometimes, they have day jobs, Otherwise, they care. Um, they have the, the, the important the, the, the outlook of looking out for their community first, and so coming to cooperate on regional efforts is really critical. Sometimes not at their top of their priorities. Uh, thank you, everyone. I appreciate that. I will continue to be uh, a part of it, um, uh, certainly. But I do think it's an appropriate time to transition. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. 
that that works well. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great way. You know, she's she's had the the task of uh, I don't want to say corralling cats, but corralling a, a bunch of as Commissioner Zuna alluded to some individual interests, but having everybody at the table. And I think a lot of that has not only been based on your persistence, but the fact that <laughs> they respect your background. Um, you know, we're talking about a lot of the public safety officials at the municipal level, so, um, and certainly appreciate Commissioner O'Brien's background and experiences, uh, uh, both from her legal work as well as her kind of uh, due diligence work people go bad so uh, I think it's a it's a great recommendation Commissioner O'Brien do you do you accept the accept responsibility <laughs> if given it uh, I do I do I know it's big shoes to fill and I agree the <laughs> the respect that she gets by, by the nature of her background and who she is um, I hope to be able to step in successfully I'm more than happy to, to do it you'll do an excellent job and and the transition will be uh, Perfect because you'll have Gail to turn to mm -hmm. as you start to. Uh, you've already met uh, so many of all the the, the local. I think you've met them all, mm -hmm. police chiefs. So the transition has been underway. This formalizes it. Yes. Do I have a motion, uh, Madam Chair? I move that uh, the commission uh, appoint uh, Commissioner Cameron as a member of the Public Safety Commission as well as Commissioner O'Brien. One or two or no? No, oh. um, no I'm sorry. No. There's only one There's representative. Only one. There's only oh, one, one representative. So sorry. it will be Commissioner O'Brien. Do you wish to restate your I'll motion? Restate. <laughs> My motion. Uh, so that first uh, is withdrawn. Thank you, Commissioner. First is withdrawn. Um, and again, move to reappoint Commissioner O'Brien as the commission's representative to the public safety committee second i would just have a, a <clears throat> the amendment of appoint uh, commissioner o'brien rather than reappoint and and uh, and add the friendly amendment that we thank commissioner cameron for her service <clears throat> do we have um, an approval all those in favor aye, aye. aye. and abstain you abstain for um a eyes and one abstention thank you and thank you again commissioner cameron and commissioner Bryan for stepping up commissioner zuniga do you wish to speak about the addiction service? yeah let me let me do in the same format uh mention that uh unfortunately unlike the public safety subcommittee the addiction services subcommittee has not met uh, for reasons having to do totally um, not with our efforts um, I do recommend that we uh, continue or, uh, the appointment of uh, Mark van der Linden um, and that we renew our efforts to, um, uh, to get the subcommittee to, um, to meet um, as, as the statute intended. There's a little caveat to all of this, and that is uh, that by, by memorandum of, under, of understanding, we do have the Public Health Trust Fund Executive Committee, which um, addresses uh, some but not everything that I think this subcommittee intended to address, um, which is why I think we should really renew our efforts um, in trying to get these um, advisory uh, services, uh, the addiction services subcommittee of the GPAC to, move, um, to meet this coming year. And perhaps the first thing is really to reappoint Mark van der Linden to that. Uh, motion or discussion? Well, discussion, I suppose. Okay. Just yeah. Well, I would agree prior. with your recommendation that Director Vander Linden um, serve in that position. He's, he's certainly got the background and passion, and um, you know, abilities to to really make that work effectively. Mm -hmm. I agree with that recommendation. I think uh, it might be helpful for us to at least put on our agenda in the near future, maybe not the immediate future, uh, just an update on, on the strategies for trying mm -hmm. to meet this uh, goal. And 
and, and perhaps stretch the strategies, including public outreach for those experts to come and participate in this important mm -hmm. work. So maybe after, maybe our later November or December meeting, we could revisit this. But I do, rec I do um, agree with the recommendation that Mark be a, uh, mm -hmm. our continued representative. Right. Any further discussion? No, we can certainly come back with, uh, we, we don't appoint the chair to this committee. Uh, the governor's office does. There was a, a, a person identified a little while ago. I think in either case, that person or someone else would have to be reappointed as well. And that's that's the piece that we'll come back to chair. So to, that would be a uh, piece to give an of the strategy to make sure yeah. we're all communicating well. That's excellent. Yeah. Thank you. So, Madam Chair, I would uh, I would move that the commission approve uh, the appointment to the Addiction Services Subcommittee of the uh, of the GPAC uh, of um, Mark van der Linde, Director of Research and Responsible Gaming. We have a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Now moving on to the, um, moving on to the other um, appointments. Or re they are, in fact, all the appointments, correct, John? Correct. So with respect to Region um, A, perhaps we could take the region separately. Is there, do you have any questions for, for John concerning those nominees? And John, can I just ask, are these, uh, these uh, committee meetings, how, how often do they meet and is the attendance strong? It's always a challenge uh, to get quorums for all of these meetings. Um, and we try to meet at least two times in the fall uh, and then quarterly. But um, it's been a real challenge, but we're going to keep on working on it. Well, thank you for your efforts. Uh, <clears throat> questions? Or I defer to John's expertise here in terms of these reappointments. Do I have a motion if there's no further discussion? Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve uh, the reappointments to the Region A LICMAC of Mr. Panzini, uh, Mr. Bancroft, and um, Ms. Negron Rivera. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5 0. Thank you. Moving on to Region B, we have one appointment, Human Service Provider Ellen Patterson. Any questions for John on this recommendation? Wearing, no? no. Madam Chair, I move that we, um, um, that we uh, agree um, with the appointment, with the approval of uh, Ms. Ellen Patronick as the Region B LOMAC Human Services Provider for this opening. Okay, a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Thank you. Does that address everything that you need um, at great. this time? So there's one other item, uh, which is uh, the 90-day report for a number of different commitments that had to be met by Encore Boston Harbor uh, as part of the operations certificate. I'm going to turn it over to Joe. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, so in your packet are two memos, one uh, dated 10-7. Uh, that provides an update on the Section 61 status of the Encore project. And the second memo is dated uh, 626. Uh, this memo was presented at the June 27th meeting and is just provided for your reference because um, the, the two memos work together. Um, so at the June 27th meeting, the Commission gave Encore 90 days after opening to complete the, the items that were presented from that memo. Um, now that the 90 days have passed, there are still a few items that need to be completed at this point. Most of them have been done. Um, you know, for the most part, these are sort of paperwork items that uh, don't really, uh, you know, such as uh, some permit closeouts with MassDOT, things like that. Um, and some minor construction items, uh, such as some work that's going on next door at the MBTA facility uh, that they're coordinating with the MBTA on. Um, you know, none of these have any material impact on the operation of the facility. 
and uh, you know they're working towards getting them done. They're just taking a little bit longer than um, than we expected. So uh, we do expect these items to be done soon, but because there are um, outside agencies involved, we have MassDOT, MBTA, City of Boston on some of these, um, you know, some delays could creep in that you know really aren't uh, in on course control. So what we're recommending is to give this another 90 days and we'll report back in December. I expect fully that all of these things will be done by then. Um, you know, and again, it's, it's mostly just kind of a, a paperwork kind of effort to get, to get stuff done. Commissioners, I'd like to just highlight one item uh, that was on the original list, which is an escrow agreement that needs to be reached between the city of Boston and Encore Boston Harbor. And so we've been carefully monitoring the progress of that document and it's in signature stage. Um, so we have anticipated that it was going to be ready for this meeting. Uh, Maybe, but we haven't heard yet today. Yeah, at four, four yesterday, four o'clock yesterday afternoon, uh, Jackie Crum had told me that, it, that they had signed, it had been sent to the city, they're just awaiting their signature, and the account has actually already been set up and is ready to accept money. So um, that's truly a, a, a real just paperwork item that we expect at any moment. Mm -hmm. So uh, each of these issues that you've outlined are close to well, being, I think um, on the first five issues on the memo, those are done. They're done. They're all um, done. And then there are uh, the, the next four are the ones that are that are almost completed. Okay. And then the, the last item on here is the we had that sort of you know that that list of thousands of items. We were down to about a hundred at opening. We're down to about forty now. I think by the end of next week, I'm probably going to knock about twenty of those off the list. So again, it's 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 getting right down to the to the, the final little pieces. But none of them give you pause. They're all um, really, you don't anticipate any snags in, in meeting these commitments. No. No. Right. Thank you. And we didn't, we didn't set this up for a vote. I thought we could just come back and revisit it in December if you want to do it, or you could vote an extension if you wanted to. I, I, Are we what, comfortable with, with December? Yes. So that yeah. gives you a couple of months. Yeah. Yeah. And the only thing I would comment on is if it, it does wrap up faster than you expect. Yeah, we'll report back soon. The first sir. meeting that it is done, or if yep. there's any issues to come back. Mm -hmm. that. Will do. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes our report. Great. Thank you, Joe and John. Moving on to item number six. This is. Um, really a combined effort of our two departments, um, Director Vanderlinden and Chief Information Officer Katrina Jakub Gomes and Scott Halwig, our Gaming Technical Compliance Manager. Oh, and we see Teresa Fiore, who is pro our Program Manager in um, Responsible Gaming. Thank you. All right. Good. I think it's I think it's officially afternoon right now. Good afternoon. It is twelve. Chairwoman and commissioner. Yes, thank you. Um, it, we we are bringing before you an update on play management for Category One casinos. It's actually been quite some time um, since we we brought this before you. It's been about a year since um, I provided an update to the commission on the status of this development. So I think it's worthwhile just providing some background to you about where we've come from and, and where we currently are. Um, so by way of background, um, a key initiative of the Gaming Commission's Responsible Gaming Program is the Play My Way budget setting tool. Um, it supports the Responsible Gaming Framework, which is to provide um, timely, accurate, and balanced information to empower patrons to make informed choices about their gambling. Um, Play My Way was developed um, and launched in June, June 9th of 2016 at Plain Ridge Park Casino. Um, it was at the time uh, we launched it as a pilot program. Um, we we uh, worked closely with Plain Ridge Park Casino, who's been a, a great partner in, in this project. Um, we worked closely with them to, to, uh, to market it or to um, uh, offer it as a benefit to player card hold player card holders. Um, patrons have the opportunity to enroll in either a slot machine or at one of the GameSense kiosks. Um, 
the program is completely voluntary. You can enroll in it or you don't have to enroll in it, which was a, a high priority of, I believe, um, now several years ago of, of Commissioner Cameron. <laughs> um, that, that that was very important to you. Um, players can set a daily, a weekly, or a monthly budget. Um, they can um, they can unenroll at at any time. Um, the they provide provided notifications at every 25% starting at, at 50% of, of their budget. It doesn't stop a player from uh, gambling once they reach 100% of their budget, but it will continue to provide notifications at every 25% interval. Um, this, as a side note, was an important feature that um, if we're providing informed player choice, we want to provide a moment. We don't want to stop somebody from gambling if they choose to continue to gamble, but it's an important piece where we provide them with information at a, a, at a juncture and they can make the decision about whether to continue to gamble or whether it's time to stop based upon that, that information. Mark, do you have any uh, statistics on, on how many players actually do stop at their budget or if they continue to play through the Budget. We do have that information. Um, we've had two uh, evaluations of the Play My Way program to, to date. I don't have the specific information um, in mind, but both of those reports are, are posted to the uh, research page of, of our website. And that statistic is in there. Thank and you. That, that and, and today that the report isn't on that. I just, because I'm kind of coming in new on this, I, I wondered. So I'll look at that. Thank you. Yes. Yes. But, but I, I think it's understand. most that choose to use the program are staying within um, their budgets, isn't that? Yeah, you know, I, I, I really want to provide okay. the, the accurate information on this, so I would need, I, I'm happy to, to go back and provide some uh, top line data right. from, from those evaluations. We intentionally didn't provide that in the update today just because it was about where right. are we going and, with category one casino. Right, I want to be fair to you on that. That was just, I wondered if you happened to not stop. I can say this that I remember, which, which was a, a, a big finding, maybe Mark is uh, just, just not want to venture, and so I, I'll be happy to venture, um, <laughs> in just rough numbers, uh, perhaps in these terms. Um, of the people that used Play My Way, uh, they uh, were more uh, likely to stay within their budgets than those who didn't. And there is, and that, that, that is a fundamentally good finding from the tool. Um, I think there's less less about whether you go over or under, but it's more about who whoever is using it is generally staying closer to the to what they intended. Um, there's also a very important uh, thing to note, which is the uptake uh, into this tool. Uh, that happened for, for a variety of, reason, but, of reasons, but especially compared to other places um, elsewhere in the, uh, you know, in, in the history that, that have undertaken it. The caveat of all of this is, um, which our, our evaluators pointed out, is whether that initial finding, whether we're seeing something that is because people likely to use these tools were likely going to be staying within their budget anyway. Uh, in other words, if, uh, and the, the comparison is for the, whether it's causation. Mm -hmm. The comparison is to the um, Fitbit, if you might remember. Um, if, if using a, a Fitbit is, if the people who are most likely to be concerned with their fitness are those that use a Fitbit um, versus those, those who don't. Um, but I, th I think there was a lot of uh, uh, a lot of great um, um, findings for, from that initial evaluation. I think, in the context of this discussion, I think we should, which was going to be my my point, but I'll make it now. Um, we should look to a feedback, some of which was from the evaluation, but then some of which was is anecdotal but powerful, um, can be incorporated to modify the tool. And I have the top one that I know Mark has heard me talk about, and that is the early notifications. Uh, there's evidence that a lot of the people that like this tool use it for just the overall total, the monthly statement, or the ability to check in from time to time. And they're not really all that interested in 
in the early notifications when when you haven't even hit your budget so some users and this again this is anecdotal i don't want to i don't want to put under the evaluation set um, um, budgets that are well in excess of what they intend to play because they don't want to be getting that notification that says you're at 50 percent of your budget well if my budget was a hundred why don't you remind me when it's a hundred and so but the point to this effort is to make sure and we i've had these 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 points to uh, i made this point to katrina and scott uh, and mark of course um, that these can be configurable uh, and i know it's not going to be configured by the user but if we are developing a tool that can change because we have now not anecdotal but real evidence or an evaluation effort that says do away with this early notification or let the user uh, choose one way or another um, that we incorporate that in these development of uh, efforts um, it's always balancing which i know that 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 is another very important lesson learned here which is if we make it too difficult for people too many options too much legalese in in the in in the site we, we turn people off and they don't sign off uh, sign up so um, all of these things come to fruition uh, and 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 that is the uh, that is essentially the efforts that are currently taking place uh, including a lot of those lessons um, that i referred to in your, I mean, to your point, I think that it's the importance of ongoing evaluation. Um, and so we have two evaluations of the Play My Way program right now. Um, the intention is that this evaluation is, is ongoing. And so while there is not an evaluation in the field right now, we continue to track data um, with an eye that, that we will uh, continue to evaluate this program um, down the road. Or at least that's, that would be my very strong recommendation. Um, uh, to, to go off script um, and to support some of what Commissioner Zuniga's uh, points, this this was uh, this was a pilot. Um, it was it, it, when we started down this path back in 2015. Um, what we had was a body of evidence um, about this type of technology, about this type of tool, that was that was somewhat mixed. Um, based upon its development in other jurisdictions. Nowhere had it been developed in the United States. Um, and and um, so what we had was, um, was uh, some gray literature at, at best looking at other jurisdictions in Australia or in uh, Canada. Um, and so the commission was put, uh, kind of challenged with a decision about how do we proceed with this. It's completely in line with where the with where the legislature envisioned um, a, a progressive, um, responsible gambling program to go. Um, it's completely in line with what our res the adopted responsible gaming framework um, and where it was what was adopted and recommended in that framework. Um, but how do we proceed then with a, a tool that, that doesn't have a solid empirical evidence base to it? The Gaming Commission, I think, very wisely took a uh, decided to, to press forward, but um, in a um, very cautious uh, manner, adopting a precautionary approach, one in which it said there seems to be promise here, um, not only just within, within um, um, other jurisdictions with this type of technology, but it's in line with other types of technology outside of the world of gaming. And so let's, let's adopt it um, in a non-regulatory approach Let's evaluate it and let's seek the cooperation of each of our licensees in, in doing so and leverage some of their expertise in this area as well. Um, and um, so th that was a lot of kind of the, the, the conversations that were happening back in, in 2015, 2016 as we, as we developed this. It was after those two evaluations, um, after our operators Category one operators had an opportunity to, to see this tool. Um, that it was decided then um, in 2018, 
date in my memo. I'm going to go back on mm -hmm. script now. I, I apologize. So back in January of 2018, where the commission met again to say, okay, so we've, we've, we have this pilot project. We have an evaluation. We, we've seen what the uptake is, um, which, is which is relatively <coughs> powerful information for us. So where do we go now beyond this, this pilot project? And the commission uh, um, decided that, that we would move again in a non-regulatory path toward um, developing a play management tool with cooperation of MGM Springfield and Encore Boston Harbor. Um, and so without a regulatory path, it was decided that the best path forward to memorialize the, uh, this commitment was through an, a memorandum of understanding, um, which was then uh, signed um, about nine months after that, in October of, of last year. And that MOU laid out what, what should we expect? What does development look like? Um, what, what should the tool, what features should the tool have, as well as what is the timeline? So based on the information that, that we had to date, um, it held many of the same features that the current tool has with some flexibility to, um, as Commissioner Zuniga pointed out, to, to make some adjustments to it. Um, and it, it set a timeline for implementation of September 1st, 2020. So with these modifications that are um, due to some of the, uh, the evaluation, right, what some of the users would be looking for. I think, oh, so what we're talking about is the user having the ability to say, don't notify me until I'm at 100%. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, it, it doesn't. It, it allows us to, to set it at, um, we, can, we can set it so it's configured so that the uh, notification would be received at 100%. It's this tension. I, 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 I'm torn between saying let's completely leave this up to the, the patron um, and the challenge there is that it has more touch points before be, between enrollment and when you're back and you're able to, to start you gambling um, and, um, or making it as simple as possible mm. where there's very few touch points which was a, an original priority of this program. We don't want there to have to be a user's guide in order to, to right. enroll in it. We don't, uh, we don't want it to be overly complicated. And so I think, um, and uh, you know, C Katrina and Scott can speak to this, I think where we're going with this is, is in the right direction, but we're still, and even, even with the current development, we have a lot to learn about what players, what will be useful for players, what type of information um, and configuration will be will be best for for them, and that's where the perf the function of ongoing evaluation comes in. Was it a strong? Um, was it just a couple of users who thought that they wouldn't want to be notified until they hit a hundred percent, or was that really a strong theme of the evaluation? I, I, you know, the evaluation provides some, some clear insight, but I, the evaluation also didn't provide um, a lot of <laughs> clear answers to, to questions like that. I think that, as, as Commissioner Zuniga pointed out, that we have anecdote, the, the strongest mm -hmm. evidence of that is anecdotal. Um, experiences of our game sense advisors and their interactions with patrons at Plain Ridge Park Casino, where they had repeatedly heard that they didn't like to receive the, the multiple notifications over, um, over the, while using the tool, but they felt like the information when they would go back in and check it was actually very useful. Mm -hmm. And that people were setting up double their budgets, let's say, so that their first notification was actually the one that they originally intended. Um, I, I think it, just to uh, really to just set back to our original agenda item, yeah. I think that we don't want to get too far off course because I don't believe um, folks are really prepared to discuss all the various uh, policy considerations that you would be considering down the road. If I understand correctly, 
the proposal today includes the technical capacity to bring in flexible, uh, to, to be flexible enough Pleasure. to uh, really address important policy Precisely. points for the future. Yes. One of which would be the kind of example that you gave, perhaps mm -hmm. less or more notifications. Yes. But that's not what we're here for today, correct? Right. Today is an update on where we stand. The, the commission adopted this MOU um, in collaboration with our, our licensees. Um, it charges um, IGT to, to go forward with development based upon those, those specific requirements that were laid out by the commission and, and our licensees. And so today is really a, an update of uh, where, we, where we are in, the, in that development. Um, and There's forgive a me because I started it, <coughs> so thank you. Um, well, uh, but I think that um, some of these, these questions that really highlight just how, how complicated this and, and complex this really is. I mean, we're, we're, we're introducing technology that interfaces with the player at a slot machine that provides them with information. And is it the right information? Is it delivered to them at, it, at exactly the right time? Does it really do what it's truly intended to do, which is provide them with information where they can make a decision about whether they continue to gamble or stop? This is, this is a fundamental question about how we promote responsible gambling in, in Massachusetts. And I think it's, it's a fantastic conversation. Um, and one that, that I think we will look at how we implement play, a play management tool now, but it will also inform um, how we move forward in, in, in this direction as well as other directions. And um, going again off script, which I'm, I'm sorry, but um, Ka Katrina and I have had some, I think, very exciting conversations about what is the intersect between um, uh, uh, technology and the programs um, that we offer in, through the MGC or through anybody else that, that gets back to this idea of how do we promote positive play, how do we promote safer levels of, of gambling for people um, who choose to gamble. And I think that, that so I think it's, it's an exciting yeah, time exciting. in a lot of different ways um, and uh, should be a, a really good conversation on going with the commission. Mm -hmm. And um, I know we, we should move on from, from this conversation, but it's really part of it. Um, we should remember, um, or for your benefit, um, uh, Chair, when we came up, we, we came up with the uh, intervals. There, we, we looked, when we first started looking at this tool, we looked at all the efforts that had been done outside of the United States on prior similar tools. And there's a lot of caution about, for example, providing um, uh, a slide bar where people might want to go to the middle where, you know, to, to set a number uh, uh, that they want to gamble um, because that might incentivize some people that would have never gone to that place to just go with that default. In other words, just the interface for simplicity versus um, what it can cause others to, to do. There was a, a subject of a lot of study and discussion. Um, we initially started with notifications at 75, 90, and 100 and it was the evaluators who suggested 50, 75 with different incremental, in the, uh, that the same number of increments, you know, a 25% increment. And my point has only been that it is in that same spirit that we should be able to look at and, and challenge those assumptions and have the flexibility to do that. The technical. Yeah, the technical flexibility. flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, because in other jurisdictions where they gave a lot of options to, um, in terms of a lot of configuration capability to the user, it ended up resulting in the user just eliminating it. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, there's too many numbers, or I got confused, I put in the wrong number, a number that I intended to be weekly or monthly, I put it in the week, and that confused me, and, I, and now I'm getting all these notifications that I didn't intend, et cetera. So, um, so that's, that's an important part of what we are set out to do. It boils down to what you just said earlier, Mark, which is we, we're committed to doing this with another evaluation effort, uh, one that I believe we have also learned a lesson from, which is I really want us to have an, an evaluation that's more in real time that can help us develop the tool and improve it, not just tell us whether there's you know a, a pass-fail kind of audit, um, 
which is something that I think is a, is a big lesson from the, from the first effort. We want this tool to continue to be improved, and, and that's how we should be thinking about the next evaluation phase. Some of the barriers in the original um, evaluation efforts dealt with um, our ability to generate very specific reports and the flexibility in those reports. Um, it's a, you know, it, it was an early version of, of this type of tool, and I think that um, that has been in our mind in the development of, the, of, of this tool with, um, with IGT. And uh, I know Katrina and Scott specifically, as we're moving through this development, the, the ability to do these type of ad hoc reports is, um, is front and center. So, you know. Yeah, just to add to that, and, and you highlighted some really important points, Commissioner Zuniga, is that this has been a growing process um, because it ha was piloted with PPC basically originally. The whole concept is evolving as we're getting evaluation and feedback from the patrons, um, as our staff has become more engaged, especially on the technical side. Um, Mark and I and Scott and Teresa have been collaborating quite a bit on how can we expand what Play My Way means to us in this moment. And um, for today's purposes, obviously, we are reporting on IGT's compliance with what the MOU uh, technical requirements are, but that does not mean it stops there. Uh, this is a continuous growing process, and I think as we get more data back, as we have access to that data, and the reporting requirements that we will uh, review and really data mine to figure out what do the patrons want to see without being more prohibitive and more of a deterrent in education, that's really going to enable us to build or work with our licensees and the manufacturers a better product. Uh, and that totally depends on our path as we move forward. So there's lots of great conversations to be had. Again, this isn't the final stop. This, I think, is just the beginning, um, leading up to a destination. I think there's a lot of iterations of this to come that we're going to see as time moves forward. So um, just one last point, and then I just want to show you some of the, the, the status of the development to date. So what's, what's happened since October of last year to date, and where do we need to go um, before September 1st, 2020? One of the, the um, so Play My Way at Plain Ridge Park Casino was built um, on the platform, uh, a scientific games platform, because that's their casino management system is scientific games. Um, we needed to, uh, it's not going back to the drawing board, but it's also, it's, um, it took significant development because um, both uh, Encore Boston Harbor and MGM Springfield use a different um, slot management system. Is that the right? IGT Advantage. They use IGT Advantage. And um, so it, it's a completely different company and it, um, it operates, functions slightly different. So, um, and so it required quite a lot of development. Um, so I thought it would be useful for us to just, um, it, it both it supports kind of what, what it looks like at Plain Ridge Park Casino in a lot of ways, but it also um, shows you what it will look like um, on the IGT Advantage system. So many, many similarities. So uh, what you see are two, two screenshots um, that would appear when somebody initially um, enrolls in the program. So this would show up either on a kiosk or on the actual slot machine itself. Um, the enrollment screen provides an overview of Play My Way um, and the incentive, um, if there is an incentive for, for enrolling. Um, can, I, can I point out a typo? Yes. I the incentive, uh, no, it's an important one. The incentive is a $5 drink credit, not a five drink award. Oh, we well, win. actually, it's, it should be a food, food, we, a okay, food, food. Um, voucher. It's a $5 incentive. Right. Yeah, well, I'm, that's, that is actually quite flexible. We, we can provide an incentive or we don't have to provide an incentive, and that's one of the areas okay. of flexibility of the program. Currently at Plain Ridge Park Casino, there's a $5 um, food, voucher. food voucher. It's not for drink. It's not for gambling. It's um, very specifically for any one of the food vendors at Plain Ridge Park Casino. 
Yeah, and just as an FYI, these screenshots, the content was, it's not finalized yet. This was just for demo purposes. Mm -hmm. So thank you for pointing that out. We will let IGT know. Yeah. Yeah. This is, no, this is IGT right. development. <laughs> I, I Otherwise, I'd have to sign up. Like, well. I was just going to say, <laughs> <laughs> then you'd have a different issue. People then, right? pushing buttons, they really don't know what they're pushing. <laughs> Can we add free soft drinks? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> You're very, like very um, attentive. <laughs> Sorry about that, um, but we will we will work on well, and it's working with our operators too, our licensees on what what do what would be an appropriate incentive, um, and how can we think creatively uh, about this. So um, that goes back to another reason why I think it's we get a lot out of a cooperative arrangement with our licensees to to advance this um, that we wouldn't necessarily get if it was just a strict regulation at this point in time. Um, so that's, these are the uh, two enrollment screens. Um, so um, budgets are broken into daily, weekly, and monthly, as I said early on, very IGT advantage, looks very similar to um, the scientific games. The amounts can be adjusted at any time to accommodate the player. So if you're in, in the middle of your play, you can uh, log into the Play My Way system and, and adjust your, your budgets. And you um, can leave two of them blank, right? You can sign up for just one if that's what you want. Correct. Um, we have a, another screen just ahead that would show um, how if you, you wish not, if you w only wish to have a daily budget but not a weekly or monthly, the other two would be defaulted to zero and you would only receive these notifications um, notifications for the, the daily amount. So here are the two budget, the, the three budget screens, I'm sorry, where you would, you would set those, those amounts. Um, for security purposes, it, it's linked to your player card. I'll, I'll play any enrollment in um, Play My Way, it's linked to your player card, so you must have a player card in order to enroll in, in Play My Way. That's because that's how it tracks you, tracks your play over, over time. Um, to ensure the security of it, um, you're asked to enter your player reward number, um, as you can see on the screen here. So they're using a player reward card, but in addition to that, they have to have a PIN number? It's the, no, no, it's the same PIN number as your player reward okay. card. Okay. So it's linked to your player reward card. In fact, this was another decision point. Do we want it to be completely separate from your player reward card, where you could, would perhaps have a play my way card and play reward card again um, we're, we want this to be as simple as simple as as possible um, with as few touch points as possible so um, we decided that it was best to link it to the player reward card and it was marked not importantly it was marketed it is marketed as a benefit of your player rewards card correct yes, we, yes. We, we need the information to track the play but it's also a point of marketing. You know, as a, a another just interesting side note, this this uh, tool was just recently launched in by the British Columbia Lottery Corp, um, uh, NBC Casinos, and they did not place it under their GameSense program. They they they, um, they placed it as a benefit under their player reward system. Um, so we obviously took a, a different path with this, but it. But it highlights the point that um, this is this is a, a, a benefit for people who are enrolled in the player their player reward programs. Okay, um, so you players can track their play over time. Players can adjust their budgets or can uh, um, or continue to to play. So this was a, a point that Commissioner Zuniga made that. Um, there are people who don't wish to necessarily receive these types of notifications, but they really value that real, real-time information about um, about how much they've spent gambling. Um, it's it's important to note that this tracks the ups and downs. This tracks exactly how much you you've spent. So it will it will take what you if you're if you're ahead, it will take that into account. But it's really a, a truly a budget-setting tool. So. If you say you want to spend fifty dollars, it will track that. It will track on that fifty dollars. Um, it won't necessarily just track the amount of money that that um, that is bet. 
and that's that's a that's an important concept, and I don't think I'm articulating it very well, but it um, it really is intended to track the amount of money that you want to spend. It's it's the net of all your uh, expenditures with with gambling minus your losses. I mean minus your um, yeah. your winnings. It would be net net loss, right? Mm -hmm. So net loss. Um, there's also a feature on here that provides um, just general information, general information about the GameSense Information Center, um, responsible gambling tips, um, and information about how slot machines work that can be accessed at, at any time. Um, you can unenroll um, at any time, which is a, a feature that was also important to the Commission when, when we first set it up. That um, there is no cooling off period. There is no delay. If you wish to unenroll, you can unenroll at any time. Again, it puts the power of this tool um, squarely upon the patron uh, of if they use it and how they use it. Um, but it does ask information about if you are unenrolling, why are you why are why are you unenrolling? And I think this was will be valuable information in, in determining how we how we continuously improve. Uh, the experience for the player and using this tool. Mark, I apologize. I might have forgotten. Can a player also access all of this information at home? They cannot access all of this information at home. It, the two places that they can access information is from the slot machine is, um, or from one of the GameSense kiosks. Okay. But it highlights, um, Commissioner Stebbins, I think some of the where are the, where, where, what direction can we go? Um, can you enroll and change your budgets while, while at home in, in kind of a, a cool state of mind? Should you be able to receive the, your notifications on a, on a smartphone and connect it, not necessarily through the slot machine, Screen through point. the kiosk, but right. have it delivered through, through your phone? Um, they, these are the ways in which I think we need to be attuned to where, where technology can take us and what ultimately will be helpful for, for patrons at, at casinos to, to stick to a budget that they wish to set. I think those points about mobile notifications would be especially important if and when the Commonwealth chooses to move forward with sports betting and or online at some point. I think that's really important to be thinking about that already. Yes. And I think the other important point here is Remind me if I'm accurate. Don't we have about 12% who who actually are using the tool? That's correct. And you that's know, a I'm, really high number. So one measurement of, of of success that you can't you can't overlook is what is the percentage of enrollment of, of eligible players. And currently at Plain Ridge Park Casino, um, where we have over 20,000 people currently enrolled in in the program um, with a relatively modest unenrollment rate um, of, uh, it's in your, your memo, of um, around 3,200 or 3,300 people have, have unenrolled. Um, if people, you know, you can unenroll at any time. We want to make this as simple as possible. So if you don't find it useful, you don't like it, you can unenroll. Um, and so I, I found this to be incredibly powerful. And I think that it speaks not only to the tool itself, but this is this is part of the GameSense program. And the GameSense advisors at Plain Ridge Park Casino, they they take a lot of ownership of this and a lot of pride that this is this this fits very well within our overall approach for um, for the GameSense program. I, I think that's key, and you know, we'll continue to you know to to value that. It happens very organically with people who are either trying the tool and need some help, and there's the GameSense advisors who can help, or the, way, the other way around, they have a relationship with the GameSense advisor and they get them to use the tool or answer yeah. questions. Um, just back to on the uptake, uh, the historical uh, uptake of some of these tools in the past is, was in the low uh, single percentages. Um, so being above that is really, is really good. But it also may speak to that the fact that there is a lot more acceptance of technology, uh, and we may be just observing some of that. It also goes right to your point about how some of it is, most of it is now moving mobile, and so um, there there ought to be a, those thinking, that thinking about you know 
where else might somebody be able to um, consult or not get notified or uh, whatnot? And just to add to that, to what you were saying, Commissioner Cameron, uh, these are all the conversations that Mark and my team have had kind of behind doors with sports gaming on the horizon and all of the other iGaming components or anything else that may hit our jurisdiction, uh, really looking at the tool and evolving it to be that mobile app to be more accessible um, and expand its usage into those newer arenas as opposed to just being on-prem um, is going to be critical to its continued success, but allow our, our patrons or allow the, the Commonwealth citizens to be more informed about their gaming decisions and their budgets and being more responsible. So all of that, like I said earlier, it's really an evolving process and um, it's really ex of course, I have to nerd out a little bit. It's really exciting for us because from a technical perspective, there's just so much complexity and data and um, just really neat opportunities to really build and expand this uh, with either the operators and or the licensees um, or developing internally. Katrina, that was my question. In terms of this technology, do we directly have access to the data so that we can perform the data analytics or will we have to be outsourcing that? No, we do have access to the data. It can be a little complicated sometimes with um, because of PPC system being on ACSC and um, IGT is on Advantage and we're a couple versions behind on the IGT Advantage, not just us, but the properties themselves. So in order for what we just uh, presented for uh, Encore Boston Harbor and MGM to take advantage of the Play My Way solution, they actually have to upgrade their entire system um, and have to be compliant in order for this to meet the September deadline for uh, 2020. Um, we have access. It can be a little kludgy, but Scott and, and Priya, our, our engineer, our gaming technical engineer, um, work diligently on making sure that that communication and that transparency into the data, the data sets are there and we're always building and evaluating reports. So as we get more familiar with the Play My Way and the responsible gaming requirements, we're, gonna, we're really digging into that more. But the bottom line is, is that technically we'll have that. Yes. That's moving forward. Yeah, right. and some of that, it hasn't been accessible to us or right. readily available, and so having uh, Scott and Katrina very involved in the development of it with um, IGT and our operators has, is really important. I can't, Bring that in-house, yeah. 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 Uh, one, one other, so uh, giving credit where credit is due, when we talk about a very successful implementation, certainly our GameSense advisors are true champions of this on site, but we also had um, a very thoughtful strategic rollout of this led by um, Elaine Driscoll um, and um, thinking about how we successfully communicate this, do a, mm -hmm. a, a successful communication of this. And from the onset, if you take a look at, at the initial enrollment of, of Play My Way out of the gates, it was, it was within the first month, if it just stayed where it was, um, it was outstanding. And, and I think that it set the tone um, for Play My Way um, to, to, really, to, to really take off. So um, thank you to Elaine um, for, for her help with that. Uh, Mark, I had a chance to share with you and, and the chair that this, this was a prominent part of a couple of presentations at the International Gaming Regulators Conference. In fact, one of the presenters really had these screenshots and, and did the Game Sense commercial, um, showed it to the audience. So there was really a lot of interest in the work that we're doing. Um, groundbreaking is how it's been described and um, lots of questions around um, what we're doing, um, lots of accolades as well. So I do think, yeah, the team has, um, and, and part of that is the communication piece uh, so I just, it's nice to be at a conference out of the country and hear so many um, good thoughts about this work. Thank you. So I don't Thanks. think you're looking for a vote today, but I think you have a consensus of our gratitude for the, the expansion of this pilot program to the other two uh, licensees, and we are, actually should acknowledge their cooperation through the MOU. Yes. Yeah. So. Definitely. That, you know, we've, we've had 
you know, over the course of the past several months, we've had a number of meetings. They are, they are there, they're present, they're, they're assisting in driving this. It's, uh, it's great to see something that started off as, as a stiff headwind that was led by the Gaming Commission to, to, to initiate this, to see um, some tailwind, to see our operators taking, taking some leadership in this um, and, some, and, and ownership in helping to drive this process. Before I go to my fellow commissioners, Teresa and Scott, do you wish to add, not to put you on the spot, but certainly you're part, an integral part of the team. I'm good, both Mark and Katrina covered. covered thank you. So. Thank, thank you, Teresa. Commissioners, any further questions for this team? No, well, thank you for all those efforts and um, keep those up. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for the update. And then we'll look forward to the policy, important policy discussion in the future. Thank you. Moving on to uh, Director Griffin and item number seven on our workforce supplier and diversity development and lots of reasons to celebrate um, a very exciting Tuesday. So we look forward to your update on that and the um, role of the best practices report. And um, I'm joined by program manager Crystal Howard as well. Welcome, Crystal. So um, first off, I um, would like to say that yesterday we released our Built to Last Best Practices for Diversity in the Construction Industry uh, at our um, event in, uh, at Smith College in Northampton, Mass. And I'd like to thank um, Chair Judd Stein and Commissioner Stebbins, um, uh, Commissioner O'Brien also um, for participating. Um, we were really pleased with the results, um, received very good feedback, and, and the audience, um, it, actually close to 100 people, um, uh, far more than we expected, quite honestly. Um, <laughs> It even uh, felt like more. I was trying to guess the numbers. Great room. Yes, yes. Um, but everyone seemed very engaged till the very end and, and um, asked great questions. And so we're really pleased with the outcome. Um, so thank you all. And um, just in summary, we had municipal and state officials, higher ed, um, um, and hospitals, uh, contractors, and builders. And I just wanted to take a quick moment to thank folks who were responsible internally for making it happen. Um, Crystal Howard, number one, um, Commissioner Stebbins, um, uh, Director Driscoll, and um, our digital communications coordinator, Austin Bumpus, were um, really, um, we can't give them enough credit for helping out, so. Um, I should add that Jill, you did a tremendous job emceeing, and you moderated a very interesting panel. So you, you. and your whole team's leadership it created a, a really exciting, exciting day. And the stakeholders were so diverse that were there, and interesting questions. I don't know, Eileen, if you want to comment, but before you go on to the substance, if you, you know, I came back really just so thrilled with what I knew was such an important event for you. It was so successful. Great, thank you so much. Um, so um, to that end, um, we re officially released this report. This is a summary. Um, the report's author, Peg Berenger of Fine Point Associates, couldn't be here um, today, she's traveling. Um, but we'd like to thank her. This is a summary. And I'll, I'll note that this report um, is already posted on our uh, website. Um, so one of the lasting legacies of the casino construction um, may well be the focus of, on equity and inclusion um, related to the construction workforce and also the 
um, business opportunities as well. Um, our agency commissioned this report to capture and share the promising practices that we saw develop over time um, with our licensees and also through the monitoring um, process. And uh, you know, this led to new opportunities for thousands of Massachusetts residents and, and um, we wanted to share some of these learnings. We think this document will be a lasting roadmap for other projects to follow. Um, so you'll see um, we, um, this is an uh, outline of the, uh, of the report. I'm going to turn it over to Crystal now. Um, so our consultant interviewed over 33 individuals to really get a grasp on what she was reporting because she was not in this industry and as you know, uh, it's a little bit difficult when you're talking about construction in its own, but then the casino diversity aspect, she had no idea. So she did a really great job when we got this first draft. It was, um, it was just phenomenal, but the acknowledgments uh, indicate those individuals who were um, interviewed, and then you'll see that most of them are from the AOC. Uh, many of you have attended one, at least one of our AOC meetings. And uh, these participants came, maybe some of them, most of them came pretty frequently, some of them once or twice, but it actually is through the history of PPC all the way from Plain Ridge to uh, the opening of Encore. So we were pretty intentional about making sure that each phase was included in the report, and she did a great job with that. Um, so the report and, and uh, the report's author concluded after all those interviews that, um, and you heard this yesterday probably uh, quite a bit, uh, the integrated supply and demand strategy. I think um, historically uh, it was thought that well, we don't have enough um, diverse workers, and that's the problem. Um, but without the demand um, and the um, diversity goals and the construction projects that are embracing those goals, it, it, it doesn't work. Um, and so this report um, calls out and, and really chronicles that integrated strategy. So as part of the overview, um, Peg, the author of the report, actually compiled a really great graphic that demonstrates the history and milestones over time, really the building blocks of how this work came together. And so this kind of opens up the document as to what we're going to be speaking about through the entire report. And um, additionally, as part of our overview, Really, it highlights the implementation of the Expanding Gaming Act and um, really hones in on the diversity plans being the integral part of the gaming license at all the way through our contracting and workforce diversity, even till as we're moving through, but primarily highlighting the construction. So in the overview, it's the importance of diversity is just reinforced, and she really bulleted out the applicants from applicant time period being diversity plans being formulated then and then how they were presented publicly for comment and then the actual implementation. So all, even just that various strategy. Um, so as we um, mentioned earlier, the demand strategy included um, effective diverse hiring and contracting practices like making diversity a requirement, um, formul formulating plans with sp specific numeric goals, uh, communicating the diversity goals widely and making sure everyone understands the goals throughout. And um, although this seems like a basic practice, it's not often um, utilized from start to finish. So from the pre-construction meetings all the way through um, uh, the project. Um, designating a compliance officer or a team, 
reviewing diversity histories um, while hiring all contractors. Um, and so these together, um, in addition to some of the others mentioned, um, really form a very strong and effective um, uh, program. Um, and as you all know, um, um, both licensees required um, their contractors to individually submit plans on how they would achieve diversity. We also require this of our licensees. Um, uh, both licensees had data tracking systems, um, and internally they provided weekly reports showing diverse worker hours and um, uh, held very effective corrective action meetings when they saw that things uh, were not working. Um, one of the, I think, newer best practices that we saw emerge was um, utilizing not just the stick but the carrot as well. And so recognizing and rewarding contractors who were um, meeting or exceeding the diversity goals. So both programs had uh, awards um, at some point during the process. So throughout the report, we actually had the opportunity to highlight some um, really great stories, which you guys have actually probably heard. The ultimate abatement was one of the greatest stories that um, came from a women-owned business. Um, so Nina and Charity was actually highlighted in the report as um, she had received an original contract of 250000 but it increased up to 1.5, actually over 1.5 million. And the unique story about Nina is that ultimate abatement, when they went through the armory building, they used an entirely all-female crew. So it was great to be able to highlight that in the report. Um, additionally, we broke out the report's demand strategy um, into both workforce-specific and um, contracting-specific practices. So we were able to bullet point out some of those throughout the report. Um, uh, the uh, report actually illustrates many examples of the community outreach that we, we and the licensees did um, through job fairs. And um, one of the interesting components we did see was that a lot of t the talk from within the industry was about core crew. And so we really had to emphasize that that was a diverse crew that people should have been using as, as their primary group of workers from day one. So there was a lot of talk around that in the demand strategy. Um, additionally, <coughs> there were some really great strategies to retain diverse workers. And that, that hard hat actually, that's, there is one of the um, strategies that Encore used in their construction phase to help identify some of the veterans who were at first a little hesitant in coming forward and identifying themselves. And it was a really great way to get um, the, the, not just the identification, but the recognition on the project of how many veterans there really were. They were wearing these, these hats to identify themselves. Interesting um, strategies that came out. Quick question. Mm -hmm. it, do we understand or do we know why they may have been hesitant to self-identify? I mean, uh, so I guess what we see is it's more, to, more of a cultural component. It's just sort of uh, we see that even in our suppliers and vendors, Bruce and I have had this conversation actually. Um, it's, uh, I want to say it's a, hum a humble component. They just, they, uh, they either don't want to identify or we have also heard that there's some stigma sometimes attached to that, that they're concerned about what that may bring to their, to people who now know that they're veterans, that they are perhaps have some mental health issues or just some of the stigma that comes from previously serving, which we've found that since they did this veteran hard hat identification process, it was actually very inclusive and people were really re responsive to that positively. So it kind of helped break that is how Encore had per perceived it to us. But um, I think it's the interesting thing about how many veterans were on the projects is that we've seen that that is not accurate. So people are more willing to come forward and were afterwards just identifying themselves. So it was good for everyone.
And here's a, another um, great story. Um, Felicia Dillon, who's on the left, attended the very first Tradeswomen Tuesday event. Um, and uh, if you'll remember that um, this is an, uh, part of a program that we helped launch and fund the Build a Life campaign um, that is administered by uh, the Northeast Center for Tradeswomen's Equity. So uh, Felicia attended the very first session and was accepted into the Sheet Metal Workers Apprentice Program shortly after. And there are many other um, illustrations of success along this way. We were celebrating that yesterday um, as well. Um, and some supply strategies um, to accompany or complement the demand strategies um, include advocacy for the underrepresented. Um, you all know that in our Access and Opportunity Committee meetings, we had um, a diverse group of individuals who came to every meeting. Um, and some of those advocates include the Policy Group for Tradeswomen's Issues. Um, we had community groups who were re representing various constituencies. And, and that's actually a really important part of the process. Um, industry recruitment. Um, we also, um, um, the Massachusetts Girls in Trade. Um, this was an effort um, launched by Encore Boston Harbor's Jenny Peterson um, in conjunction with the voc Vocational Technical School to recognize um, young women who were um, enrolled in non-traditional um, careers. And um, what started on one side of the state launched into a full statewide effort that has actually seen a couple of years and multiple um, conferences. Um, so it's very exciting. Um, yesterday, um, Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito mentioned that she's actually been to several of these. So that was exciting to see. Um, Pre-apprenticeship training um, is integral. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to correct you. You uh, are saying yesterday, but you do mean Tuesday, the event. Oh, it, it seems feels <laughs> just <laughs> like <laughs> yesterday. I've already said yesterday. But for the record, yesterday <laughs> throughout. I, my apologies. Tuesday. But that's right. Tuesday. Thank, Thank you for that clarification. Um, I was just telling someone earlier that um, it feels like Friday, so I'm a little mixed up. <laughs> Um, the pre-apprenticeship training, um, you know, uh, both licensees worked closely with um, building pathways in the eastern part of the state and then community works um, in Springfield. Um, and um, the trades union recruiting and apprenticeship programs were represented as well. Um, the contractor certification, um, our partnership with the Commonwealth Supplier Diversity Office was crucial in terms of ensuring that uh, small and diverse um, business ownership, um, uh, that uh, these businesses were actually certified and, and um, licensees could actually get credit for um, their utilization. Um, Contractor training, uh, for example, Suffolk Construction's trade partnership series to ensure that um, uh, small and minority and women-owned business and veteran-owned business actually um, were trained and understood the policies and were able to work effectively to get the contracts. Uh, so these were all highlighted in more depth in the report. Um, and then we have um, other stories, um, examples of MBEs like um, Mitchell Clinton, the owner of CMJ LLC, the landscaping and trucking company that worked at the MGM site. And there were so many great examples of businesses who um, uh, 
received an opportunity or, or um, um, worked on either project. Um, and integral to this um, um, process is an effective monitoring strategy. And um, the Access and Opportunity Committee, um, I think it was best described in this quote down below, constant monitoring and collaboration problem solving by the multi-stakeholder AOC was central to the success of this strategy. And uh, we, um, the report's author heard over and over um, that the Access and Opportunity Committee was, was crucial. Uh, this is just another highlight. Reggie Cole actually was uh, one of the contractors on um, MGM site. He actually, while we are very concerned about minority women and veterans on the project, he actually was able to report that all of his employees were from Springfield. Obviously, we cared about the locality of the projects as well. So that was um, an interesting story to highlight. So you have heard about the outcomes, but um, it can't be overstated that these practices together with our licensees, um, attention and dedication resulted in some very strong outcomes in terms of diversity and opportunity for our residents. And um, one of the key points that we emphasized yesterday was the intentionality of, um, of utilizing these practices together. And it doesn't have to be hard, but you have to be intentional from the beginning. Um, so with that, I'll close my remarks and ask for any questions. I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. And I just think the work is tremendous. The leadership um, watching you, Director Griffin, uh, uh, grow through this process when the group, do you remember the initial groups were somewhat uh, combative? And your strong, steady, um, respectful leadership really, I think, made a tremendous difference. And uh, I commend the team for the work and the results. Great work. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, early on, the Access and Opportunity Committee, um, uh, it was a very diverse group with um, diverse opinions. And um, the, everyone needed to learn how to trust each other and respect that everyone was coming at it from different viewpoints. But each were very valuable um, altogether. I I would just add to that the you know the AOC meetings and I think the way you ultimately structured them was to have both licensees reporting and I think that kind of created its own little internal competition almost between mm -hmm. our licensees. Um, certainly the relationships improved from the get-go, but nobody wanted to come in with numbers that were not as strong as the uh, the other project happening at the other end of the state. So keeping that consistent. And, and you had people who would weigh in with suggestions for both licensees. It wasn't kind of one or the other based on where somebody was based. So, uh, mm -hmm. I learned a lot of meeting management tools from watching Jill over the last couple of years. Um, yeah, one of the things that we also found was the shared learning. Um, I think both licensees admitted that um, they were able to learn from each other. So that was great, too. I have to say, one of the things that struck me as the most powerful from Tuesday was the, the real life highlights that you brought in. And we'd already heard from the gentleman who was the painter. Um, but also the, to see the employees and to hear sort of the, the real life impact um, was one of the most powerful things, I think, of that day. And then the other takeaway for me was um, I wasn't there to see the progression of it and the evolution of it. So what struck me, though, yesterday, Tuesday, falling into your pattern, yeah, right. of, um, <laughs> of the panelists, though, was really one of them made a comment about work, workplace diversity almost being akin to OSHA and, and workplace safety decades ago. Yes. And that you really are at the beginning of a wave where 
the fight, hopefully, to say that this is a valid area to focus on in projects seems to be ending, and it's more a question of implementation. Um, and it was hopeful to say to somebody, look, we were having these OSHA conversations decades ago. I lived through that, right. and this is the next phase, and we're, we're going there. Um, it was, I think, a really powerful statement to the work that you were able to achieve in a really short period of time. Right. That, I had to agree when I heard that statement. Um, and uh, I think that was Mike Kearns from Shawnet Design and Construction, who uh, is the Western Massachusetts representative. And he recalled when safety was not um, one of those top uh, tiered um, things that uh, companies right. thought about. And now, of course, you it's want a given. safe work right. site. Yeah, that's a very powerful comment I, um, or point. I, I'm sorry I missed uh, Tuesday. Um, but I just want to add my, my congratulations to all of the factors that worked well here. Your leadership uh, clearly was a, a big one. We started without, with, a, with an outside chair, uh, Ron Marlowe, who was mm -hmm. uh, prominent in other efforts, similar, uh, but not part of this agency. And I would submit that the role that we played, one, not the, 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 um, uh, detracting a little bit for one of regulator to more of a convener in this setting really worked in a positive way. There were other important factors that I think have been mentioned before. Um, the licensees were very engaged. Mm -hmm. uh, they were competing at times. Uh, this was a very visible, very highly, highly visible um, projects. And, and there was a real sense in the community and many other stakeholders that we don't want to miss this opportunity. So numerous stakeholders, many of them are credited in the report, were very involved making these meetings really working meetings, not just speaking opportunities. Uh, and that is one of the things that I think really contributed to, uh, to this success. Uh, I hope others can replicate it. I, I, I think there's differences in different projects. Uh, I think it's very hopeful that we're, at least in the minds of some, we're moving in the direction of this being a requirement, not just a wish um, or, or a given uh, for the benefit of, of, of everybody. But I, but I do think that uh, because the licensees, because of what they do, um, gambling is, is still viewed with skepticism by many. They knew they had to be very committed and very much in the form of delivering the goals that they set out to deliver. And that also plays an important factor. Yeah, I would, I would just pick up on that. You know, this is kind of a, a wrap up to our, you know, a legacy of work we're going to leave behind. But as I had the chance to ask some of our uh, partners from the building trades on Tuesday was, you know, how did, how did you feel this event went? Um, they all talked about the fact that the people that needed to hear the message were in the room, so public higher ed, uh, not private higher ed, mm -hmm. anybody who's doing a building project or is a contractor that's going to be doing future work was in that room and heard the message. And they were some folks that up to this point, the building trades had not been able to make that pitch. To you. So, you know, moving beyond the great work that we did and the legacy we created, looking to the next phase is now that there's real hope and opportunity for some of the women that were represented in that room and the veterans and, and, uh, and uh, diverse construction workers. Now they're looking ahead to think that there is going to be another project that's going to follow our model. And they were elated with that result of the forum on Tuesday. Yeah, I think there was one point when a uh, uh, mayor of a Western Mass town raised his hand during the question and answer and said, you know, can anyone tell me how you implemented this at a municipal level, these requirements? And to have um, city manager Ed Augustus being able to, um, from his perspective, um, give that advice was really great. So um, anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and again, just to recognize Commissioner 
there's Stebbins and your role, leadership in uh, this effort. You know, uh, we're very lucky to have the team of Jill Griffin Chris, and Crystal Howard, uh, <clears throat> Elaine, and others, but it's been your leadership that's been a steady uh, stewardship. So thank you for your efforts, and I know it's very much from the heart, which uh, this is in many ways, because I think Elaine provided us with the word passion-driven. Uh, passion, focus, and purpose, and, and it really resonated on, on Tuesday. And I do think that we're left with uh, an obligation to continue to, s to support replication. Uh, we have to stay within our mission, uh, but this work that you produced and that we commissioned um, will serve as a, a great blueprint. We were lucky to be hosted by, Spring, um, by Smith College that was able to announce that they exceeded their diversity goals in their recent construction of the Nielsen Library. So already we're seeing a kind of a partnership across the Commonwealth that uh, I hope that we can continue to be part of even if we're not always in the driver's seat. So we'll look for um, those replications and how we can continue the conversation down the road. It's important, important work. Great, thank you. Thank and you. I'd like to also um, give my thanks and appreciation to Commissioner Stebbins as well for mm -hmm. this project and more. I was, more. <laughs> I was, hap I was <laughs> happy let me be part of the team. <laughs> so exciting. All right. Uh, you do have another piece for us. Jim. Right. Um, uh, Director Ziemba mentioned um, that out of the utmost of caution, we wanted to bring this case before you. Um, as um, uh, part of the um, staff review of the workforce program budgets in Region B, um, Holyoke Community College and, um, and their subgrantee, um, Springfield Technical Community College, requested two minor funding changes for their FY19 um, workforce program. And um, they have requested to utilize some of those funds in FY20 that were not fully utilized. Um, um, we, we believe that these, uh, this is in line with um, what you approved. Um, However, um, there were some things that were not explicitly cl clear when we spoke to you last time, so we wanted to bring it back. Um, did you have any um, questions? Well, before I ask that, um, Holyoke Community College has requested the use of $35,000 to hire part-time career counselors uh, to advise, support, and coach participants in their program. And um, there were some funds that, um, for example, um, that uh, cost a little bit more than they had thought for um, testing and um, bus passes and things like that. So. Um, so we are, I believe, asking for a vote. Yes. Has everybody had the chance to read the memorandum? Yes. 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 Do we have a motion? Gail. Um, do we have a motion? We do. Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the revised budget and reallocation. Uh, I move that the Commission approve the revised budget and reallocation of funds awarded to Holyoke Community College pursuant to a grant from the Community Mitigation Fund as described in the memorandum from Director of Supplier and Workforce Diversity, Jill Griffin, Ombudsman Jones, the MM Program Coordinator, Crystal Howard, dated October 7, 2019, and included in the Commission packet. Second. Any questions um, with respect to the memorandum? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. Thank you for the um, really helpful memorandum that made it clear to us. Great. And I just have one last, uh, uh, Director Ziemba asked me to say one or two words regarding the workforce grants, and so I will do that. Um, 
we've, we have found these grants to be very successful in connecting individuals with um, careers in culinary, hospitality, and gaming, specifically dealers. Um, um, we have talked to licensees. The need is still great, especially in the culinary and gaming areas. Um, and so we will um, work with the um, guidelines to, um, to ensure that um, some of these funds are still available for um, these purposes, at least um, this next round. So. Thank you. That's an important theme, I know. And in Springfield, um, we learned that MGM Springfield is working very hard on workforce development, particularly in light of our unemployment rate. So uh, the work, the uh, impact of the workforce uh, development grants is really important. So thank you. Thanks. All set? Yes. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you so much. All right. OK. Oh. Are we all set to move on to item eight? Uh, yeah. Finance Division, will you be giving the report? Yes. Thank you. I, I believe that um, our Chief Financial Officer, London, is unable to make today, but I know that he's been working very hard with um, Agnes Bulio to um, provide this report in conjunction with your work, Enrique. So thank you. Sure. Yeah, Director Lennon is out on a um, family medical issue, but he uh, provided a very good uh, summary like he has done in the past of the budget closeout for the fiscal year of 2019 that is included in the packet. Um, just to recap uh, some of the figures, um, the Commission approved a fiscal year 19 budget in the amount for the, for the Gaming Control Fund in the amount of 33 million 400, 33.4 million uh, which required an initial assessment on licensees of 28.3 million. And during the year, like we do, uh, we came to periodic uh, budget, quarterly budget revisions, uh, and that grew to um, uh, 37.81 million, uh, which revenue projections were 37.64 million. This uh, necessitated 29.6 million in assessment of licensees. Um, the commission was relying on at least uh, 163,000 in reversions to bridge the gap between anticipated spending and anticipated revenues. This is as of, as of the last, the third quarter. So uh, in your packet today, there's the actuals for the year and the actual spending for fiscal year 19 uh, in the gaming control fund was 36.34 million and revenues were 37.78 uh, million the result of which is a 1 million uh, 1 1.44 million surplus for this year and as is our practice we will that will be credited towards the fiscal year 20 as initial assessment on licensees so I will point out that the Gaming Control Fund is composed of both statutory costs and regulatory costs um, of the 37.81 million budget. The gaming regulatory costs were 27 million. Uh, the Gaming Control Fund spending for fiscal year 19 was 36.34 million, which was 3.9% less than the approved the, the chart in page two provides a high-level summary with some ex, uh, high-level um, um, explanation of certain line items which were either underspent or overspent that results in the underspending that I mentioned before. Uh, but in general, the regulatory costs were underspent by 3.1%. Uh, the indirect cost was this year fully applied by, uh, by the state and represents a 12.2% increase from what was originally budgeted. Um, 
the Office of the Attorney General has underspent their budgeted amount by 11.3%. Um, the research and responsible gaming um, portion of the budget is underspent by 7.3%, and the ABCC did not spend its budgeted amount, which is every year is an amount only to $75,000. So, uh, as I mentioned, the chart on, on uh, page two uh, provides some of that high-level uh, view of the variances. Um, and as, again, as mentioned, the excess revenue or the difference between the revenue and the expenditures that provides an excess um, of the planned amount will be credited to the licensees in the amount that is uh, highlighted on page three of the memorandum. I can pause here and see if anybody has any questions relative to um, what's in the, in the packet or our practice relative to uh, budget revisions and assessments. I had the chance to meet with CFAO Director uh, uh, Derek Lennon yesterday and walked me walked me through all the numbers, so I'm pretty comfortable with his explanations and where we saw some savings. I might um, state for the record that um, legal costs we treat um, separately. We come to approve increases. We, we, we initially budget by what was what is minimum required for our insurance, but there's enough uh, legal costs still, or certainly for this last fiscal year, and we have come to ask for budget revisions in this particular area in the last three quarters. Um, notwithstanding all of that, uh, legal costs uh, after the last revision were um, we spent less than the latest revision, which is good news. Um, but they will continue with some, you know with some uh, regularity, at least in the, in the short term. This is the first year that we had um, an assessment. Um, a, a portion of the Public Health Trust Fund be funded by uh, the revenues that come from MGM. And that is what is reflected in uh, at the bottom of the chart here on page two that incorporates um, an ISA that we signed with DPH in which we fronted money because there was not going to be uh, the ability to commit on their side because money was going to build in, which was later returned uh, as agreed upon uh, to, to the Gaming Commission, which is some of the uh, seemingly large variability numbers towards the end of that chapter, to, of that uh, chart, but they should be taken together and that was a way, again, to make sure that uh, the partners at DPH had the ability to commit uh, contracts um, because the monies they anticipated to receive were going to be realized through the course of the year. The other thing that I might um, add is that um, the team who's here and, and Director Lennon are uh, very um, careful and very judicious in budgeting, looking for uh, efficiencies and being um, making sure that we are not in a negative cash flow situation, um, which is why we often, and, and this is a good practice, come with a slight um, credit every year after year. Uh, which just reverts back to the next assessment from, from licensees. Very thorough report. Any questions? No. Thank Very, you, Commissioner. Thank you. Director Lennon will be here for the next quarter, which is forthcoming uh, you know, in, a, in a future meeting. No vote needed today. Thank you. Moving on to our um, last substantive item, um, Catherine Blue, Legal Division, you have regulations today. 
we have Attorney Teresi and Attorney Lilios here to present on those items for you. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, so you have two regulations in your packet today, and we're looking for a vote to begin the promulgation process. So the first one is uh, 133.05, that's the voluntary self-exclusion reg. This is a companion reg to the junket regulation, which um, you voted on last month to begin the promulgation process on that one. So if you remember in that regulation, we require the licensees to uh, provide a no marketing list to junket operators, and the list includes people who are on the voluntary self-exclusion list in addition to people in a number of other categories. So this regulation really just closes the circle and essentially adds the same language to the BSE reg. Do you have any questions on that one? No, no we did have a chance to meet and um, fully digest the work that's been done, the rationale behind it, so I do not have questions. So you should have a um, small business impact statement on that as well. Um, so we're just looking for votes on both of those. So Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the small business impact statement for the amendment to 205 CMR 13305 voluntary self-exclusion as included in the packet. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0, thank you. I further move that the Commission approve the version of the amendment of 205 CMR 13305, voluntary self-exclusion as included in the packet and authorize the staff to take all steps necessary to begin the regulation promulgation process. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0, thank you. And then the second set uh, is changes to our licensing regulations. Uh, so Deputy Director Lilios will run you through that. Good afternoon. Good I have afternoon. a request for a number of updates to 205 CMR 134, uh, the regulation pertaining to licensing and registration of casino employees and vendors. Uh, in total, there are six provisions in 134 that are being brought before you today. Five of them are in the nature of housekeeping matters. Uh, those which I'll address first uh, reflect prior commission votes and current practices of the licensing division and the IEB. We're looking today to correct some inadvertent errors in the final printing and that's why I'm referring to them today as housekeeping matters. Uh, the first one is reflected in your packet is 134.07 which is the regulation on <coughs> application Sorry. forms. Uh, and as you'll see, subsection 5 uh, included the word identified, identified twice. We're looking just to omit the uh, uh, incorrect uh, duplicate uh, word. The next subsection uh, is 134.09, which outlines the procedure whereby the IEB and licensing division uh, work uh, uh, to approve or deny or revoke. Uh, applications or registrations and the language as reflected in your packet indicates that the Bureau approves, denies, or revokes key license applications, gaming employee applications, and service employee registrations and that the Bureau in conjunction with the licensing division notifies the applicant in writing of the specific reasons for any adverse action and includes written instructions on how to uh, appeal uh, any adverse action. Uh, and again, this reflects current practice in a, in a prior vote. 134.10 uh, and .11 are two uh, companion uh, sections. .10 sets forth the licensing standards for key employees, gaming employees, and gaming vendors, and point one one sets forth the uh, registration standards for service employee registrants and non-gaming vendor registrants. Uh, the red lines uh, uh, parallel one another, which is why I'm mentioning them as uh, companion uh, regulations. And the subsections that are being stricken in both of them are repetitive, either of prior provisions in the same regulation, or as for the final stricken language in each one, repetitive of language that appears now in our hearing regulation, uh, which is 205 CMR 101. 
turning to 205 CMR 134.14, that is the regulation on administrative closure, looking again to uh, make some uh, corrections here. This regulation out allows the Bureau and the Licensing Division to administratively close applications when the individual or the vendor is not responsive to requests for uh, required information. The regulation reflects a 14-day window for individuals to respond, a 21-day window for vendor companies to respond before there is authorization for the division or the IEB to administratively close. This again is a, a administrative closure. It is not a denial or revocation on the merits. It allows persons or uh, companies to reapply with no waiting period so long as they provide the information that uh, they neglected to uh, respond to in the first instance. Finally, there is some new language that we're proposing for 134.13, which is the regulation on uh, fingerprinting. We would like to specifically insert a sentence here uh, indicating that each person who appears for fingerprinting shall provide identification at the time of fingerprinting in the manner required by the Bureau. We'd like to be explicit about that information now in this, in this particular regulation. Uh, you should know that the procedure is that the licensing division does send the individual who has an appointment to come in for fingerprinting written instructions on the types of identifications that will be uh, accepted so that they are prepared when they do uh, appear. And also the final red line in that section uh, asks for uh, two sets of prints. We don't need three in the instances where for good cause shown uh, the IEB uh, would accept uh, 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 fingerprint cards rather than requiring the person to show up in person. And that good cause could include something like uh, the fingerprints were taken within, say, the past year, or uh, the individual is a foreign uh, individual that makes appearing impracticable. Uh, those are the uh, amendments to 134 that I'm requesting at this time. Any questions? Uh, even though they're um Mostly, uh, uh, you know, housekeeping, as you mentioned. Uh, will we still have to have a hearing? Is this a regular promulgation process? Mm -hmm. Yes, we'll have to follow the regular process. Mm -hmm. and, and we thank you for your vigilance. These um, housekeeping matters you know, happen, and it's important for us to continue to monitor the mm -hmm. final product. So thank you for taking care of that. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of substantive uh, new ones that will go through the same process. So mm -hmm. we'll stay tuned. Um, uh, do you have a motion? Sure, Madam Chair, I move the Commission approve the small business impact statement for the amendments to 205 CMR 134, licensing and registration of employees, vendors, junket representatives, and labor organizations as included in the packet. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero. Madam Chair, I further move that the Commission approve the version of the amendments to 205 CMR 134, licensing and registration of employees, vendors, junket representatives, and labor organizations as included in the packet and authorize the staff to take all steps necessary to begin the regulation promulgation process. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Five zero. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So, I think we've come to that part of the meeting where we have our commissioner updates. If there are any further ones, uh, briefly, do you want to mention uh, your latest uh, conference? Yes, uh, I briefly mentioned it earlier. Um, attended last week the International Gaming Regulators Conference very substantive, good information. Um, we will be hosting next year. Um, Director Wells has been appointed, has been, um, has been appointed and then uh, confirmed by all the delegates to be a member of that board. That's quite an honor. She's one of just a couple of um, 
members of the board that are from the United States, so um, I think she'll do a tremendous job and add great value. But uh, I was paying close attention to all the detail work because we will um, offer our support as the host agency next year for this, for this conference. And I already mentioned the accolades regarding responsible gaming and, um, uh, and the tools in our framework that were mentioned and highlighted actually at the conference. So again, very, um, very good details. Um, the other thing we were very instrumental in is the statistics committee really what does every agency do throughout the world so that there's a resource if you're doing something new? And um, we were an active member of that as well as providing the translation. I want to commend uh, Commissioner Zuniga who um, volunteered to actually um, translate and make that document um, um, uh, a Spanish version of the document that has been utilized by some of our uh, in the neighboring countries in South America and around the world, Spanish speaking. So uh, we have provided great value and um, I think it's important that we continue to be part of that and we certainly will with Director Wells' uh, participation, leadership position. Yeah, it's a, it's a great occasion. Um, I think uh, I look forward to that next year. It's probably going to be around the same time, right? Yes, Sometime that in third October. week in September, all that will be posted shortly. Yeah. Um, the Marriott Copley, it was a bid process. Uh, I want to also commend um, Janice Riley for her, I mean, Janice carried this project, frankly. She really um, is excellent at this, at many, many things, but in particular this piece. And it was really keeping two different organizations that will be com combined with IMGL, keeping them on track getting them to understand that we needed to respond quickly in order to obtain uh, a hotel here at a, at a price that is affordable for regulators. So a lot of that uh, work was done uh, by Janice and keeping the, the uh, folks on track to, to really move forward with that whole bid process. So that got done and uh, there'll be some other hurdles along the way, not hurdles, but um, but just opportunities for us to um, to assist in the planning with, with the conference. I, I perhaps should uh, mention that uh, um, there's there's no cost that comes to uh, the commission or the licensees as part of this Correct. effort. Yes. Uh, but I know conferences like these do rely on the help from people on the ground, Most agencies. Uh, and our agency, which is which they value deeply, and I think it's it's great that we can offer that. Uh, because we will also benefit from the exposure yes. um, to this group. And so will Boston and the Commonwealth. Yeah. It's a chance to showcase our region yeah. and it brings great business. So it's a great. real honor to be selected. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the recognition, it does take the hands of many to still make it happen. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Janice. Thank you, Gail. Thank you. Looking forward to Karen's work. Yes. So thank you. But it's exciting for for Boston. How many people, how many do you expect? Do you well, think? Um, there were over 200 delegates this year, but we're anticipated well uh, over 300 next year because of the combination and uh, a great interest in regulators from around the world in, in coming to Boston. Mm -hmm. Frankly, that is, uh, this is one of those cities that people really, uh, if they haven't been, look forward to it, and if they have been, they look forward to coming back. So I did a little, um, I beat the drum a bit um, and uh, and got the group interested and I believe uh, lots of folks said we'll see you in Boston next year so I believe that we'll have uh, it'll be well attended and it's such a diverse group from around the world of regulators that it's really um, it's good to learn from one another and, and I think I might add it's also a great great time uh, we were asked initially when we yes. first were conceived if we wanted to be considered as one of the um, of the uh, cities to host this this um, this conference, and we were we had not even uh, awarded any of the licenses, uh, and that was certainly going to be a uh, a hardship, I might say, on the staff that was working on 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 a lot of other important issues. But now that three licenses three licenses are are open. Uh, that we've gained uh, notoriety, as you as you correctly point out, 
I think the timing is also really good yeah. for that conference. I agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Any other updates? Okay, moving just on to item 10 for anything else that might be reserved. I don't I have not anticipated anything, anything else that we have missed. Then do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Austin. <laughs>